Welcome and thank you for standing by. All participants are in a listen-only mode today. I'd like to let everyone know that the call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect. It's my pleasure to turn the call over to Tommy Wright. Mr. Wright, you may now begin. Tommy Wright, thank you very much. Good morning and welcome everyone uh, back to day two of the 2021 Census Bureau Scientific Advisory Committee Spring Virtual Meeting. To reflect on selected highlights from yesterday, it's time to play that uh, wonderful game, Who Said That? It's the longest running uh, advisory committee game show for, for the federal government. And especially today, in, in special, there's a special edition in recognition of the six members, including Allison, whose terms end before our next meeting. So I hope you're ready to play. And perhaps rather than to call on people, I'm going to ask you to mentally uh, note your answers and note how many you get correct. I'm, I'm going to pause right after each comment, and then I'll expose the name of the person. But uh, let, let's do that. <clears throat> all right. And we will see who gets, who gets them all correct. The first quote. We will make recommendations based on science. That was Allison. We are on schedule to provide apportionment data by April 30th, 2021, and redistricting data by September 30th, 30, 2021. That was Ron Jarman. We are exploring an early release of some redistricting data called the Legacy Format Summary File during mid to late August. That was Al. During non-response follow-up, 7.4 million housing units were handled by proxy, or completed by proxy. That was Deb Stemkowski. The Census Bureau should understand reasons behind lower self-response rates in certain locations. That was Juan Pablo. According to Webster and the Census Bureau, the word anomaly does not mean error. That was Michael Thiem. Post data processing plan for 2020 census includes seven phases, and I will list them to just give some feeling of, of, of actually the detail and the work that needs to be done. One, starting with geographic process, including 152 million addresses where we believe people live. Two, decennial response file number one, decennial response file number two, leading to a census unedited file, leading to a census edited file, followed by a disclosure avoidance microdata detail file, and ending with tabulation. This, much of this work is going on now. Barbara LaPresti. The Census Bureau may want to consider Anomaly Town USA an artificial suite of test cases with lots of problems and desired outputs. Anomaly Town, USA. That was Jay Bright. One main impact of delays on field interviews is increased recall error. That was Tim Kennel. Another impact is also an increase in movers. That was John Chiker. Because of the delay in getting the 2020 census results to get a base for the population estimates program, research is underway to generate a blended base using the vintage 2020 estimates that are based on the 2010 census. That was Christine from Population. 
Our middle 2020 demographic analysis estimate of the U.S. population as of April 1, 2020 is 332,601,000. That was Eric Jensen of population. New challenges for the population estimates program this time are census 2020 timing and quality and differential privacy. That was committee member Rochelle. The Census Bureau should avoid using the term anomaly, which may raise inappropriate alarm to non-experts. That was Sally Keller. And finally, we should avoid we should check for biases, especially those potentially caused by new methods. That was Canal. I'm just curious, did anyone get them all correct? Tommy, this is John Chaika. Once I realized you're reading the speakers in order, it made it a lot easier. <laughs> Oh, uh, wonderful for you. Yes, that, that is the hint. That's the underlying hint, yes. <laughs> I'm exposed. I'm exposed. <laughs> oh, I mean, <laughs> thanks for that comment. I, you, you see how it's <laughs> and, 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 and Tommy, I, I, yes. Tommy, this is Ron. I, I expect better randomization from you. So. I, 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 but, but, but it's, but it's just, but it's a special edition, and I usually do it, but it's a special edition. <laughs> and I wanted to send at, at least the six members leaving, I wanted them to go off with joy. You see, Allison is already smiling and laughing, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. <laughs> the public will have an opportunity to comment today at 1.55 p.m. during the public comment period. During that time, we welcome members from the public to provide their comments using the chat feature. I, as a designated federal officer, will read the public comments during that period. If anyone intends to give public comments this afternoon, please be mindful that comments are limited to two minutes. Anything over that may be submitted in writing for the record. If you are unable to provide your public comment today during the 20-minute public comment period, please send your public comment in writing. The Federal Register Notice located on the CSAC website provides more information on submitting written comments. You will also find information regarding closed captioning services on the website. <clears throat> Members, as always, if you would like to comment, please click the raised hand icon found on the lower right-hand corner. Allison, the committee chair, will see your virtual hand raised and will call on you in turn. <clears throat> Since this meeting is being recorded for transcripts, we ask that you clearly state your name for the record each time you speak. Allison will also be responsible for facilitating and leading the committee discussions during the meeting. An overview of today's agenda. First on today's agenda, our committee chair, Allison Plyer, will provide opening remarks. Following Allison, Michael Ratcliffe will present the FRAMES project followed by discussant Mario Mar Marazzi and committee discussion. Adela Luque will present the new non-employer statistics by demographics, followed by discussant Jessica, Jessica McKellar. Next, even De La Rosa, De La Rosa, Rebecca Hutchison will present the business formation statistics, followed by discussant Andrew Samwick and committee discussion. We'll stop briefly for a 10 minute break. After the break, Stephanie Studs and William Arbiatis will present the Construction Modernization Reengineering Initiative, followed by discussant Jeff Lauer and a committee discussion. After that presentation, <clears throat> Rebecca Hutchison and Scott Schluter will present the new model monthly state-level retail sales product, followed by discussant Krishna Rao and committee discussion. We will then have public comment, as I mentioned, at 1.55 p.m. Following the public comment period, we will have a 10-minute break during this time, we will suspend the meeting until 4.30 p.m. for committee discussion and for committee formulation of recommendations. 
The WebEx platform and conference bridge will remain open during this time, but committee deliberations will be conducted offline. At 4.30, we will all reassemble again for the presentation of the recommendations, and we will adjourn promptly at, at 5 p.m. As a reminder to the public, during the question and answer sessions occurring today, only committee members are permitted to ask questions or make comments. And now I'm going to turn it over to our uh, chair, Allison Plyer, who will offer opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, just one little housekeeping thing. Um, let's see, I'm looking at the, um, uh, the attendee list on the WebEx, and I'm, I'm not seeing uh, Joe Whitley, who may not have signed in, which is fine. I'm also not seeing Kathy Pettit. Um, so Kathy, I'm not sure if you're signed in or uh, I don't see you here on WebEx. Just important because uh, if you want to raise your hand, I'll need to see it. And then Mario, I also don't see you. So if you can sign in and be sure to put CSAC in front of your name, that'd be great. Um, so good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for a great meeting yesterday. Um, thank, big thanks to the Bureau for um, all of the great clarity and transparency you provided yesterday about some of our questions. It's just so important for brand building, and we really applaud you for um, all the information that you're sharing. Um, I also want to thank everybody for such a productive meeting. We got through all the presentations on time. We got through discussing the recommendations on time, even though our brains were fried. And we had a fun Zoom happy hour as well. So thank you all. That was great. It has been such a pleasure working with this amazing group of experts. It, it, it really has been an honor and a pleasure. And um, I just thank you for being such a great team and working together to provide the Bureau with excellent scientific advice. I'm really proud of what we've accomplished, and I'm going to miss working with you all. Um, so Census Bureau, I want to reinforce that, you know, although it's our job to point out limitations and make recommendations, we have the highest regard for the quality of your work. There's no doubt the Census Bureau staff include the foremost statistical experts in the world, and we're excited about today's agenda, and the, which includes so many of your new innovative data products. We, we're we can't, it's so exciting to see what you're doing, and we can't wait to see what you'll do over the next decade. Um, uh, as a reminder to the CSEC members, of course, um, um, we're, we've all been working hard on this Google Doc. I made a few um, edits and a few comments. I think most of you have been reviewing that, and you, of course, can continue to do that um, today while we're speaking. Um, uh, and then we will, uh, of course, have uh, quite a bit of time in the afternoon to uh, review today's topics and then finalize our recommendations, um, which I think we're on track to do. So I'm going to just end there and turn it back over so we can get to today's great agenda. But thank you all again for all your great work. Thank you Back very much. Time. Thank you very much, Allison. And now we'll hear from Michael Ratcliffe for up to 25 minutes who will present on the Frames Project, and that will be followed by discussant Mario Marazzi, hoping he's here, and, and that will be followed by a, a committee discussion, all to take up about uh, up to 10 minutes. Michael? All right, thank you, Tommy. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here with everybody to uh, present what we've been doing about our frames pro with our Frames program to give you an overview of the, the work that's occurred so far and the vision that we, uh, we plan that we have for the future. Let me start with the challenge we're facing. And I mean, the slides went out in advance, so I'm not going to go over all of the items that are on each slide for the sake of time, because I'm, I'm really interested and excited to get to the discussion uh, to hear your thoughts. But the challenge we're facing, uh, we have a variety of frame-like data sets. And, and I'll say, when, I'm, when I use the word frames for this, for our program, we're talking about the Census Bureau's foundational data set. Uh, the master address file, Tiger database, the business register, the job frame, and the development, currently a variety of demographic assets, but the eventual development of a demographic frame. The challenge we're facing is that these frames exist in an uncoordinated and unintegrated environment. So while it's possible, and, and no process exists that allows for direct linkage of information, so while it's possible to share information from one frame to another, that has to occur right now through a series of production of extracts, 
uh, handoffs from one group to another to move those data extracts from one place to another within the Bureau. Um, and so a time-consuming, expensive process that um, does not really allow for full integration of, of information from one frame to another or make it easy for users, in, for analysts inside the Bureau to, to directly link information from one frame to another. So that's the challenge we're face, facing and, uh, and planning to overcome. Next slide, please. Can we get to the next slide, please? Folks here. Well, this is Shauna Banks. We might have a slight delay in slides, so. Okay, all right. Um, so um, our vision is uh, to, to develop linkages across the various frames that will allow for a more effective linkage of and sharing of information and access to the information that's uh, within each, each frame. Um, so to the vision to create enterprise-wide frames that are linkable in nature, agile in structure, accessible for production or research on a need-to-know basis, and that adhere to the best practices in terms of technology usage, data management, and methodology. Uh, so each frame, uh, the vision is that each frame will contain the necessary unique identifiers and keys for linkage with each other. So for example, Geographic information, geolocation underpins everything that we do. All the information we collect through our various censuses and surveys on administrative records through our estimates program exists at a location. So location is central. Uh, geography is the, the, uh, the underpinning factor to everything. So locational information would exist on each of these frames. Um, a person record would have a linkage to a job record, so the, the demographic frame would be linked to the job frame, uh, ideally through a person identification key or PIC. Job records are linked to business businesses, obviously um, uh, employers and employees, and so the job frame is linked, would be will be linked to the business frame. I'll, I'll just keep moving along um, and. Eventually, uh, the slides on the, the WebEx will catch up. So our Thank benefits, you, Michael. This is Sean Banks. We're working on it. Thank you. Okay, I'm on the benefits uh, slide four. Uh, so benefits of the vision. Um, by linking our frames, this will foster an environment to do more work in the office. Uh, it gives us the opportunity to reduce burden on respondents, whether individuals, households, or businesses, by reusing the data that we already have in one or more of the frames. Uh, that will allow us to use our surveys to pinpoint more effectively uh, the, the specific data uh, characteristics or variables that we may not have through, may not have collected through uh, administrative records or may not have within the frame, give us the opportunity to use surveys to check the quality of the information uh, within our frames and update in various ways. But it'll also give our survey uh, sponsors and our own survey the opportunity to, to target more effectively and develop more effective uh, sampling frames. We'll reduce duplication, one-off data cleaning projects, and, um, and give us the ability to report more. It'll span, expand our ability to report on changes and trends that are affecting the nation's population, economy, and, and communities. So we would be able to to assess the impact of a new business locating, or a business locating in a particular neighborhood. How many people were hired from within that neighborhood? Uh, how many new businesses were, uh, were created uh, as a result of increased employment in a particular locality, and so on. So we can just, you know, the, the possibilities are, are, are somewhat endless um, in, in thinking about how we can bring demographic data together with economic information, jobs data linked by geography to get, uh, to create more information and more detail about what's going on within communities. Um, the next few slides cover the four frames, and I won't spend a lot of time on these, but just to, they're there to give you a sense of, of you know, what we have in-house already, the contents of the frames. The first 
is the master address file. Uh, we have over 200 million address records in the MAF. Uh, the MAF, the master address file pr primarily serves the needs of the demographic surveys and, the, and of course, the decennial census, the American Community Survey. So there's been a, the primary focus for the master address file has been on residential addresses. We do have quite a few, a large number of non-residential addresses. And as part of the FRAMES program, the enhancements that will need to be made to the master address file are in that, that, air, that realm of supporting the needs of the economic side of the house by expanding and creating and ensuring that they have a complete comprehensive address list that covers both residential and non-residential addresses. And for those addresses that are used that are both residential and commercial, or businesses, you know, so for instance, people that run their business out of their home, uh, we will need to, to modify the attributes within the master address file to recognize and, and report on those types of addresses. So there's work to do to enhance the master address file to further enable linkages with the, the other frames. The business register is a business frame. Uh, we're on slide six at this point. Uh, it's our national inventory of businesses and includes over 30 million businesses. Uh, and of course, the primary frame that it would link to would be the job frame. The job frame uh, in uh, the Center for Economic Studies, the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics Program, uh, is an inventory of job records. At this point, over 14 billion job records uh, contained in the job frame, currently managed on a, a quarterly as a quarterly job frame, but we have plans to expand out to also develop an annual job frame that's linked to that quarterly job frame. And then last, the demographic frame, and, and this is the one frame that needs to be built at this point as part of the frames program. We currently have a variety of demographic assets that have been developed uh, for specific purposes over time. Uh, most currently, the 2020 Census Administrative Record, the 2020 Administrative Record Census, uh, but also uh, the administrative uh, files that have been produced for use with the 2020 Census, uh, supporting its operations. And we see those as the base uh, for development of our prototype demographic frame, which is happening this year. Michael, I'm sorry, this is Sean LeBank. Tell the next slide. Uh, we're on slide eight. Oh, slide 13. Ours are numbered different. Okay, yours are numbered different. Is this correct for you? Okay, yes, we're correct. Okay, please say next slide when you're ready to advance. Uh, Thank you. Ready for the next slide now. So just to go over, to present a few use cases and the team that's been working, um, and I'll get to, I'll, I'll get to the, the structure of the program in just a minute. The team has been identifying a variety of use cases um, deriving from linked frames or, or supporting the need for linked frames. In one, in one sense, we can use the frames to, the linkage of the frames to maintain and update information across the frames. So for instance, with group quarters, um, uh, you call it, uh, nursing homes, assisted living facilities and so forth, those exist as those residential facilities and as businesses and employers. So we would expect group quarters to appear in the master address file as a residential address, in the business register as a business, and in the job frame as um, a location uh, for, uh, in which people are employed. By reaching across these frames, reaching into these frames, we can use the business register uh, to keep the master address file up to date, vice versa, and the same with the job frame. So this will give us the ability to use our own data that we have in-house to keep each of the frames up to date and current. Uh, in, from an analytical side, uh, we can mention reporting on the demographic, uh, the impacts of, of changes to communities uh, due to economic investments. Um, we can report on, uh, more effectively report on the demographic characteristics of business owners and the employees and various types of establishments within a specific geographic area. Uh, we could, we'll be able to bring together information to report on the effectiveness of various programs. Uh, again, to, you know, programs that might focus on uh, economic investments in particular communities 
and then we can report on the, the extent to which those programs are achieving their goals, or at least create the means to report on the extent uh, that programs are achieving goals. Next slide, please. So just a bit on the organizational structure, because I think this is important. This has been a, a, an important element in our planning for the FRAMES program and how we're conducting the program. The program management office is in geography division, uh, and I'm, I lead that as the senior advisor. Um, we have four subject matter teams, uh, geos uh, one for each of the, the frames, geospatial, business, a job, and demographic. And each of those teams sit in the area of the Census Bureau where that expertise lies. So the geospatial frame team organizationally is in geography division, along with all of the other staff uh, in geography division and the senior IT division that work on uh, maintaining and updating the master address file and Tiger database. The business frame team is in the economic statistical methods division in the economic directorate where the expertise for the business register exists. And likewise, job frame is in center for economic studies and the demographic frame team is in population division in the demographic directorate where that expertise lies. And we structured this purpose this way purposely because we, when we think in terms of silos, you can think of the, the various organizational silos as centers of expertise. And we wanted the frame teams to be in those centers, those, those areas where their colleagues, where the expertise exists um, so that they're, they can work more effectively with the groups that are managing and maintaining the individual frames on a day-to-day -day basis. The program then organizationally links, just as we, we will develop linkage infrastructure, linking those individual frames, the, the databases, the teams are also linked together uh, through the program management office and through our regular interactions. We meet, we meet weekly, uh, the, PM, the program management office and the subject matter team leads. Uh, so we create that personal linkage as well to make sure that we're all moving in the same direction. But rather than try to bring everybody into a single location organizationally, again, we thought the, it was more effective to put the teams in the locations where the, the expertise around those frames exist. And then over all of this, we have a governance group uh, that Ron and Ron Jarman and Deirdre Bishop co-chair and consists of the associate directors and uh, division chiefs relative, uh, who um, whose areas manage these, these frames. So Tori Velkoff, Lucia Foster, Al Fontenot, um, uh, Kim Rabe representing the Chief Technology Office, and Nick Orsini from the economic, for the economic area. Next slide, please. Um, we've, we received official funding and official status as a, as a program with the passage of the budget, uh, the fiscal 21 budget, and in the end of December. So we've been official since the beginning of this calendar year. However, we, were, we began work uh, last fiscal year uh, to begin the project, laying the project man management foundation. And I'll cover, um, I'll talk about the roadmap. Uh, we'll see that in just a minute. But we've been doing quite a bit of work to develop the project management side of the, of the program, uh, document the as-is states for each of the frames, and then, the, and then document the 2B vision, the 2B state, uh, for each of the frames. We just completed that work uh, last week. Um, I'll be happy to talk about it, but unfortunately uh, did not have the diagrams ready in time for this slide deck. And uh, developing our roadmap uh, on a variety of the other uh, project management related documents like vision canvases, ethics, and so forth. Uh, we've also been in, we started engaging with internal uh, stakeholders and with and, and some external stakeholders, and we plan to continue that, of course, as we move along this year. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I mentioned stakeholder engagement. Um, I can talk more about that, answer questions, but you know, we've been meeting with folks, uh, both within the Census Bureau and outside, to get a better sense of how, the, how linked frames can serve their needs, uh, the sorts of 
uh, issues we need to be considering as we move forward, use cases that, that, they, uh, that they can help us identify. And again, we'll, we will continue this work to engage with stakeholders. Every time we talk with a new group, we learn something new. And um, so we'll continue this through the life cycle of the program. Next slide, please. So our roadmap, we, we've mapped out tasks for the first couple of fiscal years. Um, uh, we still need to map out the uh, fiscal 23 through 25. We are a five-year research and development program at this point. At, at, at the end of that period, um, the goal is to turn things over, uh, to move into production. Uh, so for now, we're met, we've, we've identified a number of uh, mileposts along the way for fiscal 21 and fiscal 22. Uh, key items here are to develop a prototype demographic frame. Uh, to help support 2030 testing, but also then to, uh, but also to other uh, demographic stakeholders within the Bureau. Uh, to, we're developing enhancements to the geospatial frame, um, identifying the specific frame linkage methodology, and then in 22, move, uh, continue towards completion of the uh, uh, demographic and geospatial frame enhancements. Work is going on on the business frame as well um, within the economic area to modify things, mod make changes and enhancements to, that will support linkages. And similarly, um, uh, development of an enhanced job frame prototype in fiscal 22. One thing we've recognized as we were thinking about the development of the demographic frame, and you can see in, in fiscal 21 we, we've noted develop a housing unit structure database prototype. As we thought about questions that are on some of the demographic surveys and thinking from the standpoint of storing that information and reducing burden, some of those questions relate to the housing unit itself and not to the household. So we want to have, we've recognized the need to develop a structure database in conjunction with the geospatial frame where we would store information about structures, age of, you know, the, the year built, uh, other elements that we collect through, say, the American Community Survey, the American Housing Survey, things that we would, about the structure, the, the housing unit, the building itself that we want to retain that can um, uh, be used, that, that will be beneficial in a linked frames environment and will give us the opportunity to remove some of those questions or reduce burden on respondents. Next slide, please. And, and this presents our, our high-level vision for how all of this might work. Uh, so we're, uh, the enterprise frames environment is in the center. Uh, each of the frames, um, linkage infrastructure, we've identified um, what we think the linking keys. We've identified the linking keys, uh, but again, we're, we're always open to um, advice and comments on, on what we should be using to, to link in information. We are assuming that we will, well, our, our assumption and expectation is that there will be uh, data ingest and collection processes. So we're not taking over the, the acquisition and ingest of data, but we will utilize the existing ingest processes that are uh, and, the, and the DICE process, data ingest collection for the enterprise process. We will have requirements and expectations for those processes. Uh, but data will come in to the Bureau as it, as it has through the various uh, uh, data collection processes, enter the, be ingested, in, enter the frames, uh, linked in the frames environment, and then um, data available then for research and programmatic activities, uh, data dissemination, and so on. So we'll sit in the middle of the collection process and the dissemination process. Next slide, please. And I'll finish here with our questions for the committee. Uh, I've mentioned the various keys that we are considering using, uh, person identification keys, employer identification numbers, master address file identifiers as the primary linking keys. Are there other data elements we should consider? Are there other methods that we should be considering for linking across the, the various frames? Uh, what thoughts and advice do committee members have regarding methods for measuring quality and completeness? We will need to have 
and develop, and we plan to develop methods for assessing the completeness and the accuracy of each frame. Um, and, and we're open to uh, advice on, uh, on the kinds of measures that can be put in place to determine whether a frame is comprehensive and as complete as possible. And one of the questions, uh, a question that's been coming up recently is, how do we build efficient geospatial relationships into the linking process? That is, you know, if you link an individual uh, with the job they hold, with the business that they work with, the, the employer that they work for, and then you want to know all of the other individuals in the same geographic area that they live in or all of the other businesses in the same geographic area where they work, how do we create efficient methods for locating all records within a specific higher level geography and then linking those uh, from there? So we can envision, you know, record to record linkage very easily, but we also need to develop methods for then quickly gathering up all of the other records in that same geographic area. So thank you, um, and I'm looking forward to the conversation and, uh, and discussion. Fantastic. Um, so I'll turn it over to Mario Marassi, our discussant. Hi, guys. This is uh, Mario Marazzi. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, first of all, I want to uh, thank Michael for a very interesting uh, presentation on this very important FRAMES program. Please pass to the next slide. So for decades now, statistical agencies around the world have been under pressure to find ways to take advantage of existing administrative records to support the production of official statistics. Lower costs and response burden make administrative records very attractive vis-a-vis -vis survey methods. And in fact, we have come a long way, and the best evidence is the extensive use of administrative records in the planning and execution of the 2020 census. Nowadays, administrative records are used in virtually every Census Bureau program in a myriad of different ways. But until now, there have been few efforts to ensure administrative records are used, interpreted, and processed in a consistent way throughout the different programs. The FRAMES program is the pinnacle of this agenda by envisioning a formal Census Bureau program whose sole purpose is to create common, consistent, and linked frames for use by all Census Bureau programs. The benefits are huge. Michael mentioned a lot of them. I think two of the more important ones, in addition to greater consistency and coherence in different data pro products, is that it opens the door, the FRAMES program opens the door to a more intensive and agile use of administrative records to more quickly respond to the public's emerging data needs. So I think this is very exciting, and it uh, definitely uh, has my support. Uh, so I'm very happy to hear that you guys got approval for the creation of the program itself. It's going to pass from a, program, from a project to a program. And let me go straight into the questions you asked. Um, first, uh, Michael mentioned uh, whether we could propose any additional uh, primary linking keys between the frames and methods for linking. Now, if, if, if I'm understanding correctly, the PICs, uh, personal identifiers, the EINs, and the math IDs are the primary unique identifying variables created for each item in each one of the frames it would only be logical to use them to link across different frames. That said, additional variables may be useful in the frame creation and the data ingestion process or the update process. Uh, for example, to avoid eliminating non-duplicates uh, by mistake. See, I, I believe CSAC would need to be briefed on these methodologies in order to provide you know, a better answer to this question that Michael has proposed, which you, know, you guys have spent the past year thinking about what the primary linking keys are, and I think you've identified them. I would, I would find it strange for you to use a different variable that is not a unique identifier to link uh, the different frames um, because it would lead for potentially to two objects in one frame being connected to, to a single object in another frame when it doesn't make sense for that to happen, right? I mean, it might, there might be situations where that might make sense, but there are situations where you definitely want to avoid that. Um, next slide. That was the question I, I was just talking about. So um, uh, next slide, please. Wonderful. So the second question that Michael asked was about uh, measuring the quality and completeness of these frames. This is going to be an important task for this program. It's going to be continuously evaluating to make sure that 
that the frames are as complete as possible. And it's, it's very, in order for the program to be successful, it needs to be doing this on a continuous basis. Um, I thought a little bit about this question and, and, you know, I had two potential ideas for you to think about, Michael. Uh, first of all, um, I seem to me that for the math, for the master address file, um, a spatial completeness, spatial completeness analysis is probably feasible. So, for example, how much of the surface area of the U.S. is covered by addresses in the MAF, or are areas not known not to be associated with any address, like national parks? So this would be one way, you know, using geography itself as, as a guide for the completeness of the MAF to sort of gauge uh, whether, whether the MAF is complete. Um, another uh, might be uh, to find a different database of addresses and make sure that, you know, uh, compare the two data, uh, our math with that database to see if, uh, if we're being complete. And the one example that came to mind is the U.S. Department of Transportation's National Ad Address Database Program. Um, I think they're trying to create that database to be sort of the frame for all addresses in the United States, and um, I I'm sure that the math will, will continue to to exist and uh, and and it, it needs it, it, it may benefit from comparisons with a national address database. Third question, uh, next slide, please. And the final question has to do with the efficiency of the geospatial linking between the map and the tiger. And, and I can think of several ways to structure the data that links the map and the tiger databases. Some are probably more efficient than others, but the map is is already linked to the tiger database, so. I think we would need to be briefed on the technical efficiency of this link in order to provide, you know, more detailed guidance. And, and I'm sure our CSEC members are very much open to the idea of having a greater, uh, you know, information on the inner workings of the math and these different frames and how they uh, receive data and how duplicates are eliminated um, so that we could provide more specific guidance. But until we, we get that information, it, it would be just a, a dart in you know, throwing a dart in the dark, and I don't I want to do that for you guys. Um, but you know, following our CSAC tradition, I have a, a series of questions that you guys might want to think about. Uh, next slide, please. Um, number one, especially thinking about current concerns in the world around equity, you know, many populations um, are not well represented in administrative records for different reasons. Some people call this data poverty, uh, in that you live in a, in, in a, in a data-poor environment. Uh, I'll give you a very quick, simple example. Uh, uh, electronic health records are pretty common across the United States, but in Puerto Rico, they're still uh, in the drawing board. So if you based uh, any sort of health study on electronic health records that you get, Puerto Rico would be excluded. Um, and the same happens for populations inside of the United States. So. Have you guys given any thought to how do you plan to ensure that, that forcing the consistency among different frames does not exclude populations that we know are not well represented in administrative records? It, it almost seems like there's, there should be a, a chief equity officer who is working with you with the technical side behind the scenes to make sure that, that, that you know, none of these techniques end up excluding or eliminating or making invisible populations from all sorts of surveys because if they get excluded there, then they're excluded everywhere, and that that, that would be a real problem uh, if, were, if these populations were excluded from all the surveys. Second of all, you mentioned the LEHD, and I, I think that um, it's, a, it's a wonderful program. It already links and matches different frames of businesses and people, and, and I think that it, it, to some extent, if you wanted to see the benefits of the frames program in the future, the LEHD is a great place to start. We see the, the miraculous data that it produ produces nowadays uh, it gives us all sorts of information on, on, on the labor markets across the U.S. in a very localized way. But I just want to make sure that, you know, will the FRAMES program take advantage of the lessons learned in the LEHD program? Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, leveraging existing LEHD ingestion, deduplication, or matching methodologies. Be my second question. Uh, and then my third question, uh, will the FRAMES program publish detailed documentation on how it ingests and processes the data it receives. This is very important. I mean, the Bureau already receives a lot of data, ingests it, processes it, 
but there's really very little documentation on how that happens. And, it, you know, we're entering into a world where everyone is uh, in a digital database somewhere, and, you know, people are concerned about their privacy. And the Frames program is great for creating great data and statistics, but for people who don't really understand its benefit, they might believe it's some sort of, you know, um, evil big brother uh, program out there. And that's not the case. And so it's really important to maintain the public's trust in the frames program and in the census bureau's work more generally. So I, the only way you do that is by producing more documentation than you have in the past. And, and I would think that that's something that the bureau needs to start looking at, especially in terms of its data ingestion. I'm going to throw a, a curveball, a fourth question that I that I thought of it. And it has to do with the business owners. You mentioned that one of the use cases is to really get good data on the demographics of business owners. Are you guys planning a business owner frame? Um, would this be a type of job in the jobs frame? So a person is a business owner and you just sort of, even though it's not a real job, they're the owner, um, would, you, would you organize the data as a job? Or is this just something in the demographic frame that you're, that you're pursuing so that in the demographic frame, we have a, an indicator as to the person, as to whether the person is a business owner or not. Those were the four questions, and I've been firing them off as quickly as I can to make sure I don't go over time. Um, but I'd be happy to clarify anything that I said that didn't make sense. Thank you, Mario. That's great. Um, Michael, would you like to take a minute to respond to? Yeah, yeah. Any Mario, questions? Uh, thanks, Mario. Um, yeah, so we definitely uh, we're in agreement with all of the, all four of your questions, and we've been thinking about those as well. Um, uh, one way to get to the first one on consistency, um, we could certainly use uh, information in the job frame to check the consistency and completeness of information in the demographic frame. Um, any holder, any person holding a job, obviously should be in the demographic frame. So that would be one way to, to detect and identify individuals that may not be, um, they're coming in on the administrative records that are made, that are updating the job frame, but may not be present in uh, administrative records that are being used to uh, right. update the demographic frame and may give us some insights into additional records. But yes, we're definitely gonna, as we think about maintaining the demographic frame on an annual basis, we will definitely need to find all of the variety of sources or develop methods to ensure that it's something as complete as it possibly can be. Um, so that's an ongoing task for the demographic frame team and for all of us in the program. Uh, we definitely are leveraging uh, all of the lessons learned through all of the programs that have been supporting and maintaining the, the various frames. Um, uh, we have LEHD folks uh, on the program. Um, Matt Graham, Erica Mark McIntyre for co-lead the job frame team, and um, we definitely are, are planning to make use of, of everything that you know they've learned and they uh, that that their program mm -hmm. is used, and and as well as the other programs. Uh, yes, documentation. I agree. Um, we 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 definitely will will publish as much as we. Uh, detailed documentation as we possibly can, and especially, uh, I think that fits in uh, especially clearly with one of our concerns around the demographic frame and how we assure the public that we are, you know, we're developing a frame that is, um, that will help move us forward in terms of uh, efficiency and, and reducing burden on them without creating a national registry. Uh, so documentation helps there in, in detailing what we are doing and how it benefits all of us. And then the fourth, um, uh, we've been talking within, the, within the, the context of the job frame, but also the demographic frame, you know, the need to better identify uh, business owners. And so that's part of our, our planning and enhancements, uh, whether it becomes a a variable on the, or an attribute on the person in the demographic frame or um, an attribute in the job frame, we'll need to, to make those decisions, but definitely we will need to capture that kind of information and make sure it's populated somewhere in one of the frames. Wonderful. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. This is Mario Marazzi again. Um, and, and, and I'm sorry to go on here, but uh, do you envision the FRAMES program, the demographic frame within the FRAMES program and the math within the FRAMES program to be the starting point for the 2030 census? We are working with the 2030 planning team, yes, as part of their, um, in fact, we met with them on Monday uh, to, to uh, discuss the requirements that they have uh, for use of the prototype demographic frame and then the, the full demographic frame as they develop their testing, uh, lay out their testing plan. Uh, so yes, we definitely see that uh, both of those frames as critical to the 2030 census. Wonderful, wonderful. I think it's a great way for you guys to, to remind everyone that you're just starting now, but this is something that's going to be really big within a couple of years. We will be using this as the starting point for the 2030 yeah. census. And uh, so I want to thank you. I think it's an uh, exciting time to be putting this together. Um, and, and uh, you know, maybe we should open up for other questions. Uh, do you think you would be open for a more technical briefing on some of, some of how these frames are put together? So that we can yes. provide more specific feedback. Yes, well, yes, we'll, we'll definitely be happy to to brief at any time and, and periodically on on how we're progressing. Wonderful. So I think we should open up the floor to other people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I see one hand raised. We, we're a little over time, so um, but I do see Kathy's raised her hand. So Kathy, go ahead. And Kathy, you might need to take yourself off mute. Sorry, I have a quick question um, from my lack of familiarity with the business frame. Are nonprofit um, organizations included in that frame too, or is it only um, for-profit businesses? Um, that's a great question, and it, uh, I am not familiar enough either to be able to answer that. Um, but okay. we, can certainly, uh, if, we can certainly get an answer um, back to the committee and uh, – or if there is, or if there's others from the bureau that can answer that, perhaps. Michael, this is Sean Banks. We'll coordinate with you for a response. Okay. Yeah. Thank but you. Definitely. You know, these are the kinds of uh, ideas that we we want to hear from stakeholders, uh, such as yourselves and others. You know, what do we need to have in these frames to fully meet expectations and needs for data? Great. Great. This is Allison Plyer. Um, I see Jay's got his hand raised. Go ahead, Jay. Hi, uh, Jay Bright. So I had a question of clarification regarding the third question for CSAC. How do we build efficient geospatial relationships into the linking process? And are you thinking along the lines of putting geohashes into the identifiers, or is this a different kind of question? I'm just trying to get a sense of um, what that is. Yeah, it really is, is, is along – yeah, that's – what we had in mind, you know, it, we certainly have the link, it's the ability to link from the map to Tiger to identify the higher level geographies. It's really more about the, the efficiency within the linking process. So if a user sits down at the, you know, let's say we, you know, we're envisioning we build a user interface and you've got the architecture behind it that, you know, they, they select their, they, they, they submit their query, they want information, you know, from, they have a, a pick or they have a number of picks. Um, that they then want to link to um, information in the job frame. And then they want to find all of the other picks that they don't know about, all of the other people. They may not have those picks, but exist within the same geography. How do we build that? How do we make that as efficient as possible so that as that query is gathering the, the information, linking on the picks that they've submitted, it's also then query, you know, taking the map IDs for those picks, finding all of the other all of the other map IDs and all of the other persons and jobs that exist or, or businesses that exist within that same geographic area uh, or area. So, and how do we, you know, from an infrastructure architecture standpoint, how do we make that as efficient and as it possibly can be um, without having to carry all of the geographic information on each of the frames? I hope that clarifies. Yes, thank you. Great. Um, I don't see any other hands raised, and we're a little over time, so um, Tommy, we can go to the next presenter.
Thank you very much, Allison, and, and thanks very much, Michael and Mario, for uh, the, these presentations and the discussion, and everyone and, and everyone else as well. Now we'll hear Adela Luca, who will take up to 20 minutes to present the introduction of the new non-employer statistics by demographics, and that will be followed by a discussant, Jessica McKellar, and committee discussant, which will uh, take up to, uh, I believe, 10 minutes. Adela? Is Adela there? This is Shauna Bay. Is Anetta online as well? Can you unmute yourself? Hi, hello, this is Aneta Erdi. I was trying to reach Adela as she was going to discuss this part. Yeah. I'm really sorry about the delay. Um, hmm, I don't know Everyone what happened. Give us just a moment, please. If, if Adela is not available, this was Adela's presentation. If Adela is not available in the next few minutes, I will try to to take over that would be um, good. her presentation. Um, give me one minute and I'll start if she's not available. Sounds good. This is the operator. If Adela is in the main conference, you can hit star zero. Shana Banks, give us just one moment. Shauna Banks again. Annette, can we start with you and then once we get her sorted, we could perhaps, if we advance the slides for you? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I really apologize because these are the last slides, so I'm going to try to do my best here. Hold just a uh, moment, someone's speaking. Hold on. I'm sorry. This is the operator. Ha Adela has joined. Thank Hi. you. Oh, it's great. <laughs> I, I am sorry. I was having major technical issues. I thought I was... Um, on call and you guys could hear me. Um, okay. You're in good time. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. All right, thank you, good morning. Um, uh, my name is Adela Luque and I'm a senior economist at the Center for Economic Studies and also the research lead of this work. Um, Aneta Early is the um, Assistant Division Chief for Business Owners and Government Programs in the Economic Reimbursable Service Division. Uh, she oversees the business demographics program for both non-employer and employer businesses, and, the, and um, she will chime in, in as needed. Um, there is one more housekeeping item I need to mention, um, and I need to apologize, but I will need to leave the meeting shortly after 12.15. I will uh, make sure I finish with the presentation itself, um, and this is due to a family matter. Uh, if our discussion happens to go beyond 12.15, then Aneta will take over at that point. Okay, so um, today we are very excited to update you and talk about the newly, newly released uh, non-employer statistics by demographics annual series, or NSD. Um, uh, as you might remember, NSD provides uh, business demographics estimate for firms with no paid employees. Um, I'm actually still kind of on the, on the title slide, sorry. Um, yes, there. Um, most of these firms are sole proprietors. Uh, that is firms, uh, firms with just one owner, which we usually think of as the self-employed. Um, and I just want to mention that after uh, hearing the, the previous presentation, I can see synergies between 
that prior presentation, um, uh, the, the FRAMES program, and also the presentation that is following us with the business formation. Um, so we first introduced the idea of NSD to you in December 2018, when we were researching the feasibility of producing non-employer demographic statistics by leveraging administrative and census data. Today, we are pleased to say that NSD is a reality um, and are excited to be here to get your feedback. Um, I should also mention that NSD is a result of a joint and sustained effort across the Economic Directorate and the Research and Methodology Directorate here at the Census Bureau. And now, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so today, uh, we will first go over a snapshot of the content and features of NSD. Then I'll share some stakeholders' testimonial, testimonials and a couple of illustrations from the newly, newly released uh, 2017 NSD. Uh, we'll then go over a couple of slides uh, meant to refresh our memory about how NSD came about and why non-employer demographics have gained additional interest in recent years. Then we'll talk about where we were, uh, where we are, and what we hope, hope to accomplish in the future. Um, and finally, I'll end the presentation with some questions we would um, appreciate your feedback on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so NSD is an annual data series, and its first official release was this past December with 2017 non-employers data. NSD contains firm level and also owner level tabulations uh, by various demographic characteristics of the business owner. Uh, the business level tabulations include counts and receipts uh, of business by race, Hispanic origin, sex, and veteran status. The owner level tabulations include the number of owners by additional characteristics, namely uh, place of birth, or foreign born status, citizenship status, and owner's age. Um, and these characteristics have traditionally been collected by business owner, owner's demographic surveys. Uh, those measurements are available uh, by geography and industry detail, as well as receipt size class and legal form of organization for the business level tabulations. Currently, uh, geography detail consists of national, state, and MSA levels. Um, industry detail is currently available at the two- and three-digit NAICS. Uh, later in the presentation, I will talk about our plans for increasing the level of detail for, for both geography and industry. Um, NSD provides demographic characteristics for the vast majority of non-employers with the exception, for now, uh, of non-employer C corporations, uh, which luckily represent only 2% of non-employers and 4% of receipts. Um, and later in the presentation, I will also provide some detail about our plans for non-employer C corporations. So um, NSD is not a survey. Uh, rather, it is created by leveraging administrative records and census records including the business register, IRS, IRS tax data, decennial census and Amer American community survey data, SSN Numident data, um, and administrative records from the Department of Veteran Affairs. Uh, NSD is uh, an annual series and is produced with no additional respondent burden since, since it is not a survey. Uh, it is more frequent and timely than its predecessor, the Quinquennial Survey of Business Owners, or SBO, and it also has much lower imputation rates and costs than the SBO. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so with this slide, we just want to provide a sense of how our stakeholders are using business demographic data and what they're saying about NSD. Uh, Non-employer businesses make up a very large share of businesses owned by women and minorities. So having annual high-quality demographics data on non-employer businesses is an important piece for understanding and supporting small businesses and also 
women and minority entrepreneurs in particular. Um, since it happens to be National uh, Women's Month and more than 90% of women-owned businesses are non-employers, we can just uh, focus on the testimonial from the National Women's Business Council, which is the one in the middle of the slide. Um, and in particular, they mentioned that it is critical to have a picture of the entire women-owned business landscape uh, of which non-employer businesses are a large and crucial piece. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so here are a couple of simple little illustrations from the 2017 SD. Um, on the left, you have some graphs with shares of 2017 non-employer businesses and receipts by sex, race, Hispanic origin, and veteran status of the business owner. Uh, for instance, looking at the shares of um, the shares by sex, we see that um, in 2017, about 42% of non-employer firms were owned by women and that women-owned businesses accounted for about 24% of non-employer receipts. Um, to give you a sense of what Nesty tables look like, uh, on the right you have an extract from one of the tables. The last two columns uh, show the number and receipts of firms by demographic characteristics at the national level for all sectors. Uh, so for instance, looking at the first data row, uh, we see that in 2017, there were about 1.3 million female Hispanic white owned non-employer firms with about $30.3 billion in revenue. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, in the next couple of slides, we will be going over how this became about and why non-employer demographics have gained additional interest in recent years. Um, so it is well known that in the last few decades, surveys have endured declining response rates and increasing imputation rates and costs. At the same time, the need of stakeholders, policymakers, um, and the public for more frequent, uh, timely, high-quality data has increased over time. Among other things, the Census Bureau has turned to leveraging administrative and census records, uh, as well as survey con consolidation, to address these challenges and create new innovative data products at higher frequency and timeliness. And UNESP is a prime example of, of that effort. Um, also, this type of effort serves the dual purpose of fulfilling census's vision of leveraging existing data to produce at lower cost, high quality data products, as well as, as, well as of um, unburdening respondents and better allowing surveys to get at issues that cannot be easily and or appropriately be captured with administrative or third party data. And as this predecessor was the Survey of Business Owners, or SPO, which is the, the uh, what you see at the very top of that, um, of that graphic. Um, the SBO surveyed both uh, non-employer and employer businesses every five years, in years ending in two and seven, and provided demographic characteristics for all businesses, uh, employers and non-employers uh, with a three-year lag. Uh, looking at the left-hand side of the graphic now, um, NSD represents the continuation of the non-employer component of the SBO. Um, as a side note, I should mention that the last SBO was the 2012 SBO, that um, the next SBO would have been the 2017 SBO, and it would have come out in 2020, uh, just when NSD was first released. Uh, looking now at the right-hand side of the graphic, we see that the annual survey, um, annual business survey, or ABS, represents the continuation of the employer component of the SBO, and also consolidates three business surveys. Uh, the annual survey of entrepreneurs, the business R&D and innovation survey for, for micro or small businesses, and as already mentioned, the employer component of the SBO. 
Uh, last year, non-employer and employer demographic uh, estimates were released separately, uh, but the plan is to provide business demographics uh, seamlessly for all employers, um, non-employers plus employers, just like the SPO used to do. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and here's a bit more background on employers. Uh, next, the non-employer universe consists of firms with no paid employees subject to federal income taxes and with annual receipts of $1,000 or more. As of 2017, there were approximately 26 million non-employer businesses in the U.S., accounting for about 80% of all businesses, uh, but only 3 to 4% of receipts. Approximately 87% of non-employers are sole proprietors, like I mentioned earlier, and those are businesses with only one owner uh, that are usually thought of as uh, self-employed self -employed persons. Um, while traditionally employer firms have captured most of uh, the attention of stakeholders, researchers, and policymakers, non-employers have gained more interest in recent years. Uh, so, for instance, um, from 2014 to 2018, uh, non-employer business growth uh, has outpaced that of employer firms. Um, specifically, uh, non-employers have increased about 11%, while employer fir firms have grown approximately 4% during that time period. Uh, most recently, Employer Identification Number, or EIN applications, which are a proxy for business formation, um, have seen a sharp V-shaped increase during the pandemic, as you can see in the graph. Um, studies suggest that um, a large share of those applications will likely become non-employer businesses. And you'll hear a lot more about uh, business formation from Emin and Rebecca in the next presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here's Nesdi's timeline for the first five years and beyond. Uh, we currently are in year four, uh, which is the first non-gray panel in the graphic. Um, as I have already mentioned, we had our first official release last year in the year three, 2020, with 2017 non-employers data. Uh, the first two years uh, were our research phase where we explored the feasibility of producing annual non-employer demographic statistics with just administrative and census data. Uh, this, first year, this, uh, this year, uh, 2021, we are making progress on three fronts. Um, the migration or transfer of NSD from research to a full production mode, the release of NSD 2018, and also we're continuing research in a few areas that I will uh, go over in more detail in the next slide. In 2022, we think the migration or transfer will be completed and that the 2019 SD will be uh, done in full production mode. Uh, we also plan to continue our research uh, in 2022. Um, moving on to the Beyond Migration panel, our, um, one of our goals uh, has been to shorten the dissemination lag from three to, f to two years. Um, and we are actually considering the possibility of doing that with the 2020 NSD, which would be released by the end of calendar year 2022. Um, and we are aiming to shorten the dissemination lag for that year in particular for the obvious reasons that it is a pandemic year and we wanna, we wanna see how those 2020 non-employers uh, are doing as quickly as possible. Um, as I mentioned earlier, another goal uh, is to publish demographic estimates for employer and non-employer firms combined. And this is something that we're currently aiming to do ahead of schedule. And in fact, uh, the 2018 SD uh, being released this year in 2020 will contain a table uh, with demographics uh, for, do for, all, um, sorry, for all businesses. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, and here's some more detail on our next steps. Um, uh, the first three I have already talked about, which is the combination of non-employer and employer demographics, um, the increased level of detail, the of detail, um, 
uh, ge uh, geographically and industry-wise. So for the geo detail, uh, we um, are thinking that we can actually do that with the 2019 SD. We, uh, we think it's doable to go down to county level. Um, and we are also uh, thinking that we can do with the 2019 SD going down to the six digit uh, names. Um, also, as I mentioned, we're aiming to shorten the dissemination lag from three to two years with the 2020 non-employers. Uh, we're also looking at augmenting uh, the set of characteristics that are relevant in understanding non-employers' behavior and outcomes. Uh, these include household characteristics such as mar mar marital status, number of dependents, home ownership, and even health insurance arrangements in the household. Uh, characteristics related to the gig economy, such as whether the non-employer also works in the wage sector, transitions from non-employer to employer status, and some firm level characteristics such as firm age, um, whether the firm export or imports. We are also working on obtaining uh, and perhaps imputing demographics for non-employer C corporations. Uh, C corporations are corporations in which the owner and the company itself are legally viewed as separate entities um, for tax and liability purposes. Um, and this is actually not the case for S corporations. Um, currently, NSD does not include C corporations because there are no administrative records that unequivocally identify all owners of C corporations. But fortunately, as I mentioned earlier, they only represent 2% of non-employers. Um, finally, we are also addressing an existing conceptual misalignment between NSD's administrative records-based veteran concept from the Department of Veteran Affairs um, and the survey-based concept of military status captured in the annual business survey for employer firms. Um, to that end, we are evaluating if and how uh, Department of Defense data can either supplement or replace altogether the administrative data from the Department of Veteran Affairs. And uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and finally, here are some questions we would appreciate your feedback on. Um, so we have created NSD, the NSD program, at a fairly fast pace. Um, and now our plans involve improving the program on multiple fronts to enhance, to enhance its usefulness. At the same time, we have the limited resources and we cannot do everything all at once. Um, we want to think of and anticipate meaningful uses of NSD data and its potential enhancement, enhancements. Uh, to, uh, so to help us with that, um, in what ways would you use enhanced NSD data and how would you go about prioritizing? On a related issue, uh, one of our strengths, uh, one of the strengths of the program is a strong strongholder base. Um, at the same time, support requires negotiations uh, with multiple stakeholders with different interests and priorities in a given year. Um, but again, we have limited resources. Um, so with this in mind, what could be possible strategies for addressing different requests equitably um, given, given limited resources? Um, finally, there are trade-offs between having a survey-based and an administrative records-based data product. Uh, NSD produces high-quality estimates of business demographics on a more frequent and timely basis. Uh, than its predecessor with no additional respondent burden and much lower imputation costs and rates. However, there is some loss of content uh, on items that are hard or infeasible uh, to obtain with administrative records. Uh, stakeholders tell us that they are okay with the trade-off um, because they amount to a net gain. Uh, in some cases, though, the loss of information is important uh, to understand and help non-employer businesses, um, like for instance, sources of business financing. 
Uh, so with that in mind, we welcome your suggestions for potential strategies uh, to obtain um, that, type, that type of information. Uh, and with that in mind, we thank you. So that would be the first slide. And we look forward to your, to your comments. Great. Um, so we uh, have Jessica McKellar set up to be the discussant. Jessica? Hi there. Good morning and afternoon, everybody. I am so excited to talk about this because I spend all day, every day, thinking about <laughs> uh, small business owners of, of various shapes and sizes. So um, it's a real delight to be able to, to talk about this with you all. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so a little bit of background before uh, responding directly to the presentation questions. Um, <clears throat> so there is tremendous public interest and value in understanding the non-employer business economy and how it is changing. Uh, for example, there is significant public discourse, legislation, and litigation around the gig economy. I, I live in uh, California where some of the most contentious ballot props uh, over the past couple of years have been related to this topic, for example. And NSV is an opportunity to help the discourse be rooted in sound data. And I think as part of CSAC, we can always be excited about sound data. Against that backdrop, non-employer businesses may be early adopters of new types of economic activities and may experience rapid expansion into these new activities. For example, uh, in terms of industry, we've seen the rapid rise of the sharing economy, sharing your car, sharing your house, sharing your parking spot, um, online skills marketplaces for various types of freelancing, uh, monetized online content creation. Uh, on financing, we've seen innovations like crowdfunding, um, equity crowdfunding with changes to qualifications for equity investors, um, the use of microloans, so this is an area that is often uh, rich and rapidly changing and kind of on the forefront of, of, of economic changes. And that creates an interesting tension and opportunity with NSD as a series derived from existing records. How well do the data and data taxonomies of other surveys, the surveys that NSD is derived from, capture the non-employer universe and its distinct characteristics? So, Non-employer business data and, and the analysis and as the hold an opportunity to help make visible and highlight these early adopter activities and to help them be salient in broader census discussion around adapting methodologies and taxonomies to keep pace with our rapidly changing economy. And that is tremendously exciting. Next slide, please. So against that backdrop, uh, so the questions from presenters, there were two questions around stakeholder management and prioritization, and then a question about uh, sort of how to obtain new kinds of information in particular, or with one example being business financing. So to tackle those in turn, um, next slide, please. So on the topics of prioritization and stakeholder management, to facilitate, this is new. We have an opportunity to, to uh, you know, uh, to, to frame up the future of NSD. Um, so to facilitate prioritization and stakeholder management, it may be helpful to articulate the current and anticipated categories of stakeholders for NSD, as well as the current and anticipated categories of consumers of the data and use cases for the data. And then also uh, the anticipated impact from potential NSD enhancements. And that articulation may help distill the largest themes in consumer and stakeholder priorities. It may help to distill the enhancements with greatest potential impact. And, and those things together, I think, would help guide NSD priorities with transparency to all uh, consumers and stakeholders. Um, so at a high level, that would be uh, one way of thinking about this. Next slide, please. And then on the topic of obtaining new kinds of information uh, and information like business financing, one question I would have back to, to the group is, what are the limits on data acquisition for an SD? Is the, is the plan that long-term it will always be scoped to synthesizing census data? Because that, that's going to impact what is possible here. Regarding business financing specifically, um, is there an existing standardized taxonomy of business financing activities? So, for example, 
And going back to, to how um, non-employer businesses have, have potentially some, some different characteristics from other types of businesses, um, in a non-employer business context, uh, does financing include the use of personal savings uh, or perhaps informal loans from friends and family? A comprehensive taxonomy of business financing activities may inform what strategies are possible for obtaining financing data for non-employer businesses. Great. Well, you know what? Short and sweet. Sweet. Those are the three questions. Those are the three answers. And I know we're a little over time, so I'd love to go to the next slide. Thank you all for discussing this really important topic. And then, yeah, we'd love to see if there's further group discussion. Awesome. Thank you, Jessica. I love the way you present. Very enthusiastic. That's excellent. Keeps our attention and that's great. Um, I don't see any hands raised, but does anybody have a question? It's such an exciting new product. Oh, I see John Chaika. Go ahead, John. John Chaika. I'd like to know what exactly is the universe of the non-employer businesses? Uh, are you picking up everyone who files a Schedule C and doesn't have employees? Or is it some narrowing of that? I assume you're basing your definitions on tax data. Hi, this is Aneta Erdi. I am assuming that at this point, Adela Luque has logged off. Um, so I will try to answer also she is the technical lead. That is correct. We, we have the full universe of the non-employers. This is administrative data, not a survey. It is primarily 1040C um, tax returns. We align the non-employer statistics by demographics with our Census Bureau existing universe of the non-employer statistics that has already existed at the Bureau. So are you able to separate people who were forced to, who have no businesses, but are forced to file Schedule C because you know, they, they have an employer who doesn't treat them as a regular employee or, you know, someone gets an honorarium and it gets reported in a way that requires Schedule C to collect uh, Social Security tax. Is that a distinction you're able to make? Um, I am not the, the actual researchers of the program. Um, I, I, I'm assuming so, but I would have to get back on that particular question. Okay, thank you. Hi, this is John Tucker. This is Shauna Banks. If you'll submit what you're looking for, we'll certainly get your response. Okay, thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh huh. Okay. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, and since we're over time, maybe we should move on to the next topic. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Adela, Aneta, and Jessica, for that uh, session. And now we will hear for up to 20 minutes from Eamon Delazar and Rebecca Hutchinson on the business formation statistics. And that will be followed by a discussant, Andrew Samwick, and committee discussion, up to 10 minutes. Eamon? Actually, this is Rebecca. Can you hear me? Oh, Rebecca. Rebecca, yes, yes. we can. Yes. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Or good afternoon, I guess. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> so I am Rebecca Hutchinson, and I work in the Economic Indicators Division. I am joined by Emin dindler Laws from the Center for Economic Studies. Emin and I are here to present on the business formation statistics, one of the Census Bureau's experimental data products. I am going to provide some background on how the business formation statistics were developed and what data we published, and then Emin is going to share some insights into the data. Next slide. The business formation statistics, or BFS, provide timely, more frequent measurements of early stage new business formations. Prior to BFS, the earliest insight we had into these formations was the Census Bureau's business dynamic statistics. And they offer annual information on business entry with a two-year lag. Now, with BFS, we can offer monthly and even weekly insights with the BFS. The data source for the BFS is the IRS's EIN application, which is also commonly known as the SS4 form. 
these data are delivered each week to the Census Bureau, and it is administrative data, so the BFS did not require any additional or new data collection. Using the information on this form, we are able to create series on the number of business applications filed, as well as actual and projected business formations originating from these applications. Next slide, please. The BFS started as a collaborative research project with economists from the Census Bureau, as well as economists from the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, and the Universities of Maryland and Notre Dame. The BFS were first released as a research project, or product, excuse me, on Valentine's Day in 2018. The BFS research data were really well received, and the research staff soon began working with the production staff to transition the BFS data into production alongside our other economic data products. The next slide provides an overview of the outcomes of that transition. Um, next slide. So by the summer of 2019, we had fully transitioned BFS to production and we released the first quarterly BFS experimental data product in July of 2019. One of the benefits of moving the data product to a production home is that our indicator production staff are really well versed in efficient processing. As part of the transition, we made it a priority to identify areas for improvement in the processes and then implemented those improvements where we could. One such improvement related to when the geocoded variables were applied to our BFS data set. Previously, it was applied monthly, but we worked with our production staff to have those variables applied each week immediately when the data sets were delivered by the IRS. It was a very small processing change that at the time we were excited about because it cut our quarterly processing time nearly in half because we didn't have a month lag in waiting for the variables. But this small change became even more important than we could have realized in the spring of 2020. It allowed us to quickly pivot to producing a weekly BFS when the pandemic began and there was a critical need for timely data across the country. On April 9th, 2020, we published the first weekly BFS with application data at the national and regional level um, with the data being published just five days after week's end. Almost immediately after that release went out, we received emails from data users asking us for the state level data on a weekly basis and we started publishing that the following week. The weekly VFS data are quite popular and they, they are used by the Congressional Budget Office, the Small Business Administration and the Federal Reserve. Knowing that this information was critical during the pandemic, we have been fairly agile in adapting the weekly VFS to meet our data users needs for example, as Emin will show you shortly, the BFS activity during the pandemic has been quite interesting and knowing the application types by industry proved to be a critical piece of information. So we added a one-time release of the weekly series by NAICS in October of 2020. We continue, or we will continue to do the weekly release for as long as there's the need and the interest. But we also recognize that a quarterly publication of the full BFS report was not timely enough anymore. So beginning in February of this year, we switched to a monthly publication of the full BFS report. Um, next slide, please. On this slide, you can see that over the past year, the BFS data have been widely used and widely referenced. Weekly BFS, or weekly visits, to the BFS website are up over 600% since March 2020. Um, BFS has been featured in numerous articles and news stories, some of which are on this slide. Um, there was a recent feature on CBS News about BFS. So I've touched a little bit on our publications, but before Emin walks through um, the data, I just wanted to provide a quick overview of the data we actually published. So next slide. 
the BFS data are published on varying frequencies and granularities. Um, BFS has four application series that are based on tabulations of the filtered SS4 form counts. These series are featured in our weekly, monthly, and annual county publications. BFS also has eight formation series that capture the applications that lead to businesses with employees. These series are featured in our monthly publication. Our monthly publication also includes industry counts for all 12 series at the national level. And now I'm going to turn it over to Emin, and he's going to provide a deeper dive into the BFS series and how they behaved during the pandemic. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. So uh, I will briefly describe the uh, next slide, please. So I will briefly describe the individual BFS data series first and then talk about the behavior of business applications during the pandemic. Uh, to generate the four different business application series, we apply several filters to incoming EIN applications based on application characteristics revealed on the application form. Uh, not all EIN applications are for businesses. Our core series is business applications, which contains all the applications except for those ostensibly made for non-business purposes. The excluded applications are trusts, estates, tax liens, public entities, and other entities with little business intent. Next slide, please. Uh, we also feature a series called high propensity business applications. These are applications with a relatively high likelihood of becoming employers down the road. These likely employer applications satisfy one or more of the four criteria. They are from a corporate entity or indicate hiring employees, purchasing a business, or changing organizational type, provide the first wages paid or planned, uh, and in certain industries, manufacturing, healthcare, food and accommodation services, and portion of retail. BFS also includes a separate series, two subsets of high propensity business applications with particularly high probability of turning into employers. These are applications with planned wages and applications for corporations. Next slide, please. Uh, we also identify employer business formations from the incoming applications using the Census Bureau's longitudinal business database which provides the incidence and timing of employer business births. Business formations within four quarters is the series that track employer businesses originating from business applications within four quarters of application. This series, however, does not cover recent years since new business information in the longitudinal business database has a lag of two years. To fill the gap, we provide a model-based projected business formation series for the periods for which actuals are not yet available. We also offer a duration series that measures average delay from business application to uh, employer business formation. I should note that all business formation series are also provided for an eight-quarter window. Next slide. Our analysis of the BFS series overall indicates that business applications provide forward-looking and timely information on business formation. We are working on exploring further properties of business applications as early indicators of aggregate economic activity. Overall, uh, more frequent and timely data in BFS allows better monitoring of the state of entrepreneurial activity by geography and sector. Uh, and BFS proved especially useful during the COVID-19 pandemic for near real-time tracking of business applications using weekly data. And I'm gonna talk about that next. Next slide, please. Here is the time path of business applications in 2020 at three different frequencies of time. The data at weekly frequency on the left shows a very sharp decline into week 13 and a very quick recovery afterwards. The monthly data in the middle captures the decline as well, but does not fully indicate how fast and sharp it was. The quarterly frequency on the right hides the initial sharp decline entirely. Overall, the weekly data, while a bit noisy, made it possible to capture the very fast dynamics of applications during the early phases of the crisis. Next slide, please. Business applications and transitions to employer businesses from these applications had very different dynamics during the COVID-19 recession compared to the Great Recession. 
Here we have the time path of the year-over-year -year growth in state level weekly, cumulative number of business applications and employer business formations before and after the start of each recession. We use a regression framework to control for state and week effects and look at the year-over-year -year growth rate as a function of the number of weeks from the beginning of each recession. The year-over-year -year growth rate is measured with respect to a non-recession reference year and the recession start is indicated as week zero in the x-axis. For week zero, the growth rate is also normalized to zero. During the Great Recession, the growth rates of both business applications and formations fall and stay negative for at least 50 weeks after the start of the recession. In contrast, on the right panel, during the COVID-19 recession, the growth rates of applications and projected transitions drop substantially, but rise back up very quickly the growth rate becomes positive in about 20 weeks for applications and in about 30 weeks for formations. In many ways, these patterns may not be entirely surprising because the two recessions were quite different in their drivers. The Great Recession was initiated by a deep financial crisis, which appears to have had long-lasting negative effect on business formation, whereas the COVID recession was mainly driven by restricted physical business activity in some sectors, but not others and likely pushed many entrepreneurs to alternative modes of business, such as e-commerce. Uh, it also resulted in much higher unemployment than in the Great Recession, which likely led to a substantial rise in self-employment activity and applications for non-employer businesses. Next slide. The effects of the pandemic on sector and state level application activity were also highly uh, uneven. Here we have business applications by broad sector for uh, 2019 and 2020. Uh, as you can see, the degree of surge in business applications was very different across sectors, suggesting that there was a shift in the sectoral composition of applications during 2020. The largest rise in applications volume by far was observed in the retail sector. Next slide. And within retail subsectors, uh, the rise in the number of business applications was driven particularly by a surge in applications for non-store retailers, which contains internet-based businesses. Uh, this pattern indicates a significant shift towards e-commerce activity during the pandemic. In fact, non-store retailers accounted for 33% of all new business applications in the first three quarters of 2020, as opposed to only 9% in 2019. Next slide, please. The geographic disparity in the time path of applications was also highly pronounced. Both the initial decline in application growth and the subsequent surge were uneven across states, as shown here for some selected states. Uh, this large variation is perhaps not too surprising given the fact that states experienced different effects during the pandemic and adopted very different policies to mitigate the impact. Next slide. And finally, uh, I would like to mention some uh, ongoing research projects uh, uh, on BFS. Uh, we are looking at the properties of BFS as an early indicator of economic activity with a goal to establish some BFS series as principal federal economic indicators. In this context, we are comparing BFS monthly series with monthly economic indicators generated by Census Bureau and other agencies. Another project seeks to understand non-employer business activity or uh, origination from, uh, originating from business applications. This project leverages the work done in the context of non-employer statistics presented earlier by my colleague Adela Luque. We are also explore, exploring local origins of business applications and formations with an eye on the effects of local characteristics. In this project, we utilize several data from uh, ACS, uh, Annual Community Survey, uh, decennial and other census products to measure local characteristics such as race, gender, education composition at the census tract level and relate to business formations and applications. Finally, uh, another project is analyzing sectoral shifts and reallocation in business applications and formations during recessions with the goal of understanding the sectoral restructuring induced by recessions. Uh, next slide. So here are uh, two questions for the committee members. Uh, we are now publishing the BFS series at a higher frequency and with more geographic granularity. 
Are there other cities would you like to see in the future? And what uses of BFS do you see in your specific expertise, industry, and practice? What else you, would you like to see in BFS that would make it more useful to you? And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to the discussion. Terrific. Um, so great to see these new data products. They're amazing. Uh, Andrew Sandwich is our discussant. Go ahead, Andrew. Hi, this is Andrew. Can you hear me? Yep, we hear you. Yep. Great. Well, my thanks to Emin and Rebecca for another interesting presentation. We heard from them a year ago with an overview of the BFS, and it's nice to see the progress. I appreciate the work that's been done by the Census Bureau to launch the product on an experimental basis in collaboration with economists in the Federal Reserve System and academia. And I think the BFS has the potential to be a very informative economic indicator, and I like the way the presentation brought that out. I agree with the conclusion that more frequent and timely BFS data will allow for better monitoring of entrepreneurial activity in the United States. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So in view of the time limit, I'll, I'll just get right to the questions uh, that were posed. Uh, the first has to do with publishing the BFS at a higher frequency and with more geographic granularity, uh, are there other series uh, you would like to see in the future? And I guess if I could have the next slide, I would just distinguish between the frequency of the data and the lag with which it is released. Uh, the nice thing about um, these data are that they sort of come from the IRS and the IRS collects much of it uh, online with the relevant information. Um, in the year of the pandemic, I think it was extremely important to have a data collection mechanism that could be released at a weekly frequency uh, in a very timely manner. Um, I don't know how important the timeliness will continue to be outside of periods of extreme uncertainty. Uh, I also wonder if we will need to collect these data um, as the presentation indicated uh, and release them weekly forever. Uh, if I could have the next slide. There were some other data series that were available on a weekly basis, and I'm sort of a broken record at, at committee meetings about the initial UI claims. Um, but this was one of the clearest indications that we got uh, a year ago. Uh, in fact, it was, it was um, a year ago next week. Um, that we were in for something that was quite unlike uh, any sort of economic disruption we had ever seen. Uh, in March of 2020, uh, for the week ending um, March 14th, initial UI claims were 282,000. The next week they were 3.3 million. The next week they were 6.9 million, and they stayed that high for another week. That was the clearest indication that anybody got at that time of how deep this uh, issue is going to be. And so when you're in these periods of extreme uncertainty or an unprecedented shock, uh, having the ability to collect data on a weekly basis is very important. If you look, though, at the way uh, people typically do research uh, on the economy, weekly data tend to be sort of too noisy to use, and, and they're rarely used, in fact, for the initial UI series, uh, most people, when they refer to it, will refer to it using the four-week moving average, or they just use the monthly employment survey uh, from the CES uh, or, the, uh, or the CPS. If I could have the next slide. And so until I see, you know, some, some clear evidence, I guess, that uh, on an ongoing basis, policy varies at the, uh, at the weekly uh, frequency, I guess I'd be broadly indifferent to how, to, um, to whether this is, continues to be released uh, at that frequency. If it's no great cost to do it, that's fine, but I suspect that's not how it'll be used uh, by most analysts outside of periods of extreme uncertainty. Uh, the place where I would, I would press uh, is on jurisdiction or the geographic area. And it's great to see the monthly release um, by state. Uh, I think that's extremely important. Uh, if I could press my luck, and, and because you did ask, 
uh, I would suggest that almost pushing this down to the county level uh, would be useful at a frequency that is something higher than annual, whether it's quarterly or whether it's monthly. And I guess the reason for that, if I could have the, uh, the next slide, has to do with uh, the second set of questions uh, about the use of the BFS that I see in, in my own experience or, or decision making. Uh, and so I'll provide the answer to that on the next slide, which is my last one. I think the biggest economic story is the long-term polarization of economic experiences uh, by geography. Basically, the coasts are pulling away from the heartland and the urban areas are pulling away from the rural areas. And the way you get that is by looking at the very least at the, at the MSA level. And so since MSAs are aggregates of county, and when you enter your information at the IRS website, it will tell you what county it thinks you're in. Uh, it seems like that would be uh, reasonably easy to do and it would have value because it would allow us to distinguish how the economy is playing out in different geographies uh, with different opportunities and challenges. Uh, I think as in the current crisis, uh, we should retain the ability to collect this data and release it nearly real time uh, in terms of uh, a, a weekly frequency. Uh, the last time I discussed something, it was the Small Business Pulse Survey, and it was as well giving us uh, very, ac very interesting, uh, often quite accurate, um, real-time information. Uh, I also anticipate, uh, being a Floridian by birth, uh, hurricane season every year, and so I sort of feel like the ability to get another perspective on what happens in natural disasters uh, could be an important use of, of a series like this. And the last thing I'll say is that I'm always looking forward to uh, continued research on the time series properties of these statistics, particularly in the ongoing effort to see if they can be a principal federal economic indicator, because I'd like to understand uh, whether shocks are, are typically reversed uh, in, in a reasonable amount of time. So I appreciate the, uh, the work that was done on that in the presentation to compare, for example, the last two major recessions. And so those are my responses to the comments. I hope they're helpful, and I'd like to allow for some time for committee discussion. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, this is Allison Plyer. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was great. Um, does anybody else on the committee have a question or comment? I'm looking for raised hands. As I'm looking up, I'll jump in and say once again, you know, the timeliness of data when we have these disasters, and I will definitely put the pandemic in the category of disaster, um, is, is, is just so valuable. So um, I'm really grateful the census is uh, looking at ways to make data available quickly um, when we have these kind of major shocks. Um, okay, I don't see any hands raised. Oh, wait, there's Mario. Go ahead, Mario. Hi, this is Mario Marazzi. I just uh, would be remiss if I if I uh, suggested that uh, the Puerto R the, the coverage uh, be expanded to include Puerto Rico, um, recognizing that Puerto Rico is not in the IRS data, but that the Census Bureau has Puerto Rico Treasury data um, equivalent. One would think that this would be something that could be explored sometime in the next couple. Of Months or years, and that would be a, posed in a question: Would that be possible? Um, thank you for that, um, Dean Bennett. That question has come up, and it is something that we are exploring the possibility of of being able to publish. Wait. Okay, let's see if there's anybody else. Um, okay, I don't see I don't see any other comments um, or hands raised. Um, so I think um, Tommy, maybe maybe we can move on. I, I think we can, and in fact, uh, thank you, and uh, thanks to Rebecca, Emin, and Andrew. And uh, the agenda calls for a ten minute break. So if we can come back at uh, one o five. 
Excellent. Thank you. Welcome back. The conference will resume now. I'd like to turn it back over to Tommy Wright. Mr. Wright, you may now begin, sir. Thank you very much, Tommy Wright. Uh, for the next, welcome back, everyone. For the next 20 minutes, up to 20 minutes, we will hear from Stephanie Sturtz and William Abriatis on the Construction Modernization Reengineering Initiative. That will be followed by a discussant, Jeff Alauer, and committed to such discussion for up to 10 minutes. Stephanie? Thank you, Tommy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Bill and I would first like to thank everyone for this opportunity to provide updates on the progress of our construction reengineering project. Next slide, please. I want to start with an overview of the programs and the data associated with the construction reengineering project. There are three Census Bureau principal federal economic indicators that measure construction. Our new residential construction program, new residential sales, and construction spending. Currently, several monthly surveys are used to obtain these data, and they're heavily reliant on both a field and paper collection. The goal of the reengineering project is to modernize these operations to create a contiguous construction program remove the silos between the programs, including within even the Census Bureau, with help from our demographic and decennial directorate partners, broadening the use of alternative data sources, which as we've discovered, construction is a very, very rich environment for the data, creating new data products with more granular detail and at a higher frequency for our data users, developing new programs to better measure repairs and improvements, and being able to provide near real-time data to respond to natural disasters like hurricanes and forest fires. We expect the return on investment to be considerable given that our construction indicators produce some of the most highly sought after data in the Census Bureau based on our website and download metrics. Next slide. The foundation of our construction indicator programs is our building permit survey. So that is where we began our re-engineering research efforts. The building permit survey uh, does local governments monthly and annually to ask the total number of new residential units authorized by permit. It would be too burdensome to ask the, these governments to give us information on every individual permit. But several private entities have begun aggregating building permits, so we're leveraging data from those vendors to reduce our need for survey data collection. Obtaining these individual permits from vendors would also facilitate more detailed sub-county estimates by zip code, for example. We want to, we actually work to match our data for two vendors to the jurisdictions that we surveyed to assess completeness and accuracy, and to also establish rules for correctly classifying the permits based on their descriptions. Next slide. What we found is our vendor data covered about 2,000 of the 20,000 permit jurisdictions in the U.S. skewed uh, towards our largest jurisdictions, which is actually very positive for us. Based on our initial research using vendor data from October and November of 2019, we estimate that the jurisdictions covered by the third-party uh, vendors accounted for about 70% of single-family units authorized in the United States in 2019. Beyond data provided by the vendors, we're also able to obtain information for some jurisdictions from local websites where individual permits are posted because they are public information. And where we were able to find standardized site forms or APIs, we are leveraging web scraping and other automated methods to capture permit data. Next slide. We are further refining our processes um, of these sources to classify permits correctly. This slide includes use of tiger shape files to match the latitude and longitude information from the vendor files uh, to correct jurisdiction and to correctly identify only issued permits and not applications. That was one thing we did find in the vendor data that we do have to distinguish between is applications versus actual issue permits. We are also assessing the timeliness of the monthly vendor data to ensure it meets the criteria of our indicator program. Next slide. 
Our next steps will further refine this process and will include incorporating expanded vendor coverage, improved mapping by geolocation, and validation of the number of housing units for multifamily permits. All of these efforts bring us closer to our goal of reducing our reliance on traditional survey collection. Next slide. In our future state, the reduced need for collection will allow us to measure all 20,000 permit jurisdictions every month at a lower cost than the current monthly sample-based estimates. Starting in January of 2022, we are hoping to be able to provide complete monthly county and sub-county totals uh, with our new Tableau tools for users to view and download our estimates. We would eliminate paper questionnaires and ask jurisdictions not covered by the third-party sources to report electronically. About half of all of our jurisdictions author uh, authorized less than five permits per year. Their monthly data could be imputed without significantly impacting quality, and we're exploring new methods for them to easily report to us. Next slide. But the true power of the individual permits will be our ability to track the construction using artificial intelligence and satellite imagery. Next slide. Our goal with this part of the project is to demonstrate that construction starts and completion can be accurately estimated using satellite imagery, meeting our existing monthly indicator timelines and at a cost equal to or less than existing methods, which rely heavily on field collection. Next slide. This work began in November of 2019, and we've collaborated extensively with Statistics Canada, who had independently begun similar research. In 2020, we moved forward and obtained some open source satellite imagery. We've worked to train our machine learning models to classify those images and validate our results. Next slide. Using historical 2017 single-family building permit data from the Census Bureau as our starting point to identify our construction sites, we use satellite imagery to locate images associated with these locations at specific points in time. For each location, our team applied three image searches to find an image representing each stage of construction, pre-construction, a construction start, and a comp construction completion. Some locations did not have an image for all three dates, so we only collected the ones that matched the dates and locations precisely. We classified a total of 3,000 images that would become our baseline for training and testing our construction detection models. Completions are currently classified as having a roof in place. Further research will be done to determine how close this is to the actual completion of construction. Next slide. The team implemented two different convolutional neural networks to classify these images. These deep learning tools mimic how our human brains learn to recognize patterns and similarities and are the most trusted techniques for recognizing and classifying images. The layers of the CNN extract features to train the algorithms to recognize images that typify construction starts and completions. The features include the census map tiger shape files as well as colors. The integration and rapid implementation of the map tiger shape files into our research is attributed very much to our colleagues in our geography division here at the Census Bureau. We used 80% of the images to train two different machine learning models to identify them, holding 20% of those images in reserve to use them to test the validity of our models. The results showed that two models classified 93 to 94% of the images correctly, a positive confirmation that we could replicate the classification on newly acquired images. The results are positive, but it's, it's important to ensure that our models can scale to meet the needs of the construction indicator program. Next slide. We moved forward in the creation of a confusion matrix to study images that were difficult to classify like the one shown here. We conducted manual review for these images that were less accurate. It was important to manually review them, understand why the images were classified incorrectly, and then determine how to use this information moving forward in the improvement of our models. Next slide. In February of 2021, we moved from testing and training to our hunting mode and testing the scalability of our models. 
After training on the images from specific construction stages, our pre-construction, our starts and completion, the model can take a never seen before image and determine which construction stage it most likely represents, avoiding data inaccuracies that survey responses can represent. This mode can also find construction starts in non-permit areas where building permits are not required. There are areas like this in the state of Texas where they are not required to file a building permit. So with the satellite imagery, we can now find those. Um, and in addition to that, our field staff do road canvassing of hundreds of miles of roads in sampled tracks to locate these starts. We're continuing in this effort to collaborate with Statistics Canada, and we're acquiring more images to scale up this validation effort. Next slide. As we transition from development and testing to our hunting mode, or what we're considering more of our production environment, we're starting to test the satellite to provide imagery not yet seen by our model and see how well the model performs not only locating the construction, but identifying our stage of construction. Next slide. To assess the performance of the model in hunting mode, we need some hard data to validate against. By combining <clears throat> the detailed starts data from the Census Bureau's current survey of construction, combined with census shape files using our Ultrax workflows platform, we were able to map known starts. This provides the validation targets needed to assess the hunting mode performance. Next slide. With the known starts mapped, we identified areas with a high density of starts that would provide the biggest bang for the buck in our validation effort. Satellite images were purchased from Airbus for these construction dense areas, making sure to only include images with low cloud coverage and that also fully covered the jurisdiction boundaries. Next slide. On the left side, you're, you will see the original satellite images meeting our, our criteria. Before the model can do anything with it, it has worked to break down the, uh, our images into small tiles, as you can see in the center of the slide. Then the tile is chosen on an average lot size for a new home, about 8,900 square feet or a fifth of an acre. This image shows as the example of how our tiles are next gonna be fed into the model for classification. So that's what you see on the right. This is now what the model has taken the large scale image on the left, gridded it into tiles. And now what the model is seeing. Next slide. The production mode was run on a new dedicated server with an upgraded set of libraries to speed up the processing. Each tile within the image is classified as either a start, a completion, or pre-construction, along with its associated level of confidence. Currently, about 10,000 images can be classified in about 13 minutes. Next slide. This, this slide shows a sample of the image classification results with highest confidence classifications at the top and least confident classifications at the bottom. Within the starts category, you can see that while the highest confidence classifications do seem to be actual starts, the model struggled with images it had not yet encountered, which included parking lots and tree cover. The team is working on mitigating this model confusion with additional training to isolate non-construction images into their own categories, such as parking lots, swimming pools, and trees. Next slide. <laughs> To validate the results of the hunting mode, we're matching the counts of the images detected to be construction starts against our survey collected counts of starts for matching locations. Next slide. We're also exploring a revised methodology for gridding images as the 10,000 tiles per image can represent a scalability concern. There is potential to define larger grid areas that are input to a separate model that will automatically detect the boundaries of construction projects as shown here. These bounded images would then be fed to our classification model. Next slide. Up till now, what we've walked through is our hunting mode, where new satellite images are fed into the model and construction starts are detected. Now, once a start has been detected in hunting mode, we will now switch to what we call our tracking mode, where we will track that location on a monthly basis via satellite imagery, applying change detection techniques to track construction progress and tag the construction activity as complete based on the presence of a roof 
a driveway, landscaping, or absence of construction vehicles. The change detection model that we would use in this example is already tested, and we're ready to um, take it for task images. Next slide. Our next steps include creating a graphical user interface to allow for human validation and model feedback. As we discussed earlier, we want to continue to ensure that images the model cannot classify are reviewed and moved into our library of known images to improve automated performance. We will continue to classify more SOC start locations, both urban and rural, and test detection of construction in non-permit locations. We plan to automate construction boundary detection. We will also train new construction categories like streets, parking lots, trees, and pools so we can better filter out our false positive starts. Then we will expand the models to train them to classify residential, multi-unit, and commercial buildings. Ultimately, our goal would be to develop a model that helps us to infer the monthly dollar value of construction put in place for our construction spending series. Next slide. The future state of our programs will replace most of our conventional data collection with models based on satellite imagery and other alternative sources. This would allow us to do larger samples which would reduce our statistical error and allow us to provide more detailed data products, including estimates by state. Savings from our reduced data collection costs would be used to improve our estimates, including better measures of residential remodeling. This is all I have to present for today on the progress we've made since the last time we met. And at this time, I would like to thank the CSAC Working Group and introduce Jeff Lauer. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. This is Jeff Lauer. Um, can you hear me? I can, Jeff. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and we can go into the discussion. And, and um, next slide, please. So I just want to thank Stephanie um, and the whole team for their work. It's really impressive. I think it's a, an incredible use of innovative techniques. Um, change detection from satellite imagery is something that's kind of a hot ticket item right now in the remote sensing world. Um, next slide, please. So this, just for background, I found this graphic. This is pretty interesting. Um, this is published literature on, in remote sensing on urban change detection, and it's areas or articles that have an emphasis on uh, remote sensing techniques similar to what uh, Stephanie and her team are doing. Um, you can see it really peaks in the last couple of years. Um, 2020, I think, is an anomaly um, pandemic-wise. There wasn't a lot of, of R&D and research going on and articles published. Um, but you can see that it's, it's really increased over the last 20 years, and that's really for two reasons, uh, the first of which is the availability of satellite imagery. Um, you know, there's a lot more options and a lot more availability and better resolution of satellite imagery across the board, uh, particularly within the last 10 years. Uh, then the second reason is just the increase in computing power um, for complex analysis. And this is definitely something that requires some pretty pretty high-end computing power. So um, Stephanie has some questions at the end of her presentation. I have some um, of my own as well. But um, so if we could back up a couple slides to Stephanie's questions. So to, to provide some input on these questions, the first one, can you discuss opportunities to communicate this effort to industry leaders and principal stakeholders? Um, the most immediate opportunity is a conference that's coming up in a couple weeks, and it's probably already on your radar. I'm sure it is, um, but it's the ASPRS uh, conference, and it's basically March 29th through uh, April 2nd. So it's literally two weeks out. Um, I looked at the agenda. Um, there are it's a five-day conference. There are over 30 sessions related to image classification, change detection, and machine learning techniques. Um, I think this is absolutely relevant. You may be on the agenda. Um, I did not see something from the census there. But um, if you're not on the agenda, I would encourage participation, um, at least in those technical sessions, to, to kind of get some ideas of where your process fits in with the rest of the community. Um, the second question. Uh, what current and new products would you prioritize for the future product or project? Um, what are the industry's most critical needs? Um, I think the products you have are completely relevant to the goal. Um, 
one of the ones I think would be a very interesting sort of byproduct um, in addition to new construction or construction identification would be some sort of identification of the structures themselves, even ones that do not change. Um, I think that would be a beneficial data set, um, and it really spans across multiple government agencies. Um, for example, there's an initiative right now with the FCC to do broadband mapping uh, for the nation that brings it down to the structure level. So a data set like that would be a, a very beneficial byproduct. And then the third question, are there any additional data sources that we should investigate? Um, one I know that was investigated in the address canvassing process was utilization of uh, three-dimensional data such as LIDAR. Um, I think that would be a good good data set to, to use or investigate. Um, the source of that, the, the most prevalent source would be the USGS's three debt program or three-dimensional elevation program. Uh, that's a national program with planned cycles and updates and uh, similar to the initiative uh, for construction identification, um, that program also has derivative products like building extraction. So just from the LIDAR data, um, there's routines that are uh, run to basically identify uh, the vector boundary of buildings, which would complement, I think, the work that you're doing, at least in terms of a validation of, of new starts and construction. Um, another potential data source is commercial aerial imagery. Um, there are a number of programs out there on the private sector uh, to collect uh, what I would consider like available content. Uh, one that I'll, I'll reference is a, a company called Hexagon um, that has national coverage of imagery at multiple different resolutions, uh, all of which I think are better than what you're currently getting from satellite imagery. Um, so that would provide uh, potentially another, another available data source and then uh, you know, just based on the granularity of that data, um, the potential to do more detailed analysis and even even to the point of doing uh, analysis to see construction additions or modifications to existing structures. And then the fourth question, um, are there any additional modeling techniques we should investigate? I think your models are, you, you said it, you know, they're the most, in, you know, right down, you know, this whole line of R&D I mean, I think they're good. Um, I'll go back to the one about adding some sort of three-dimensional component. Um, that could either come from a totally external data set like LIDAR, or it could come from the stereo coverage of the satellite imagery itself. So um, that's a typical process with satellite imagery is to do stereo 3D uh, extraction or compilation. Um, so that's something that can be investigated. And then uh, just in the articles of this past year, I've seen reference to um, integrating the change detection like you're doing with street level imagery. So some sort of combination between aerial and street level imagery. Um, and actually, I think there's two or three presentations at ASPRS that are directly related to that. So, I mean, that would probably be a stretch. That would be an extremely complex data management um, scenario. So, but it's interesting to do that, you know, in terms of uh, both aerial or satellite and street level. All right, can we go forward a couple slides? So my questions are, um, the first one is just, could you give just a little bit more detail of the source of the imagery that you're using? Is it a single source or multi-source? You know, obviously multi-source would be a lot more complex of, a, of an analysis, you know, with different resolutions and different spatial accuracy. Um, and then what's the geographic coverage and frequency? Um, is, is it a commercial purchase or is it done, you mentioned uh, open source. So is this all just freely available imagery or is this something that is planned to be purchased through some sort of contract or agreement? Um, and then is it already positioned? Um, is it, you know, what, what sort of process is used to, to basically position that, you know, from a flat image to something that has, you know, coordinate space? Um, and then another question, I'll just kind of go through the questions and, and we can, you can hopefully respond to some of those or just take it for feedback moving forward. Um, so the hunting and tracking mode, uh, I was really excited when you mentioned like near real time data set, um, you know, for things like disasters and, and really that's the holy grail of content management is for basically 
to have a model and system in place that could, you know, generate that data without or with minimal uh, human and in, human inter interaction. So, um, how you know how automated do we see this program becoming? Like where where the satellite imagery is downloaded, you know, on a frequently, you know, some sort of frequency, and then analyzed like through all these programs, and then just you know highlight things you know, for the for the users to go investigate. Um, so I'd be interested to know kind of what the plan is for automation. And then the next slide. And then once the program, you know, is finalized in terms of the analysis techniques, um, how integrated do you see this program become becoming with other uh, production needs? And a good example is the change detection for address canvassing. This this type of technique seems to be a perfect fit for what was done for address canvassing, and it would, I think, would complement that process very well. And then, what are the production plans for a finalized program? Is this something that, like I said, is it a, a contract for image source? Um, would the analysis be done by the census in-house, or do you see it being done through some sort of contract? And then, just some sort of rough level of labor needed to maintain a program like this. So. That's it. I know that was a lot of information in my time, but I wanted to get it all out there. So anyway, I appreciate um, the presentation, Stephanie. I think you all are doing a great job. Thanks, Jeff. And I can certainly take a moment if we want to go back for just a moment to the previous slide, and I'll use just a few minutes to answer a couple of these. So right now, Jeff, we are really in the research phase for the single source and multi-source. So we did originally in our research open it up for using open source images that were available. Then um, we have started to look at images from a couple of vendors. Um, we, in, in all honesty, being an indicator, we would probably never lock in on just a single source. It would most likely be a multi-source in order to mitigate any risks that are out there. Um, we, have, we are talking to a number of vendors as well as to Staff Canada about this. Um, our geographic coverage would be once a month across the U.S. to take those images and bring them in-house so that we would always have fresh um, satellite imagery and vintages of the U.S. where we believe the construction is taking place based on latitude, longitude, where we know the permits are, um, and that would occur every month. We will do um, at least, we would do some commercial purchase, and there is discussion about doing some partnerships with other agencies. We're not quite there yet on that. Um, let's see. On the hunting and planning, so the holy grail to us, and we'll see how close we can get to this. Right now, what we understand is we could get the changes from the imagery in about four hours after the satellite passes over a given set of um, locations. Our goal would to be to bring that in at that four hour mark in as near real time, be able to automatically classify those fields of construction and be able to make that data available. That would also that would also feed our other construction program that we haven't gotten into a lot yet. It's the next phase of our research, which is really our construction put in place, where we would not only identify the changes, but then potentially create algorithms that would allow us to do costing of the different phases of um, the construction as well. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so, I talked a little bit about that. We are working with our counterparts in Decennial. We are actually looking for them a lot, both in geography and the Decennial components, just because of the amount of um, history and just the knowledge that's there. They've helped us a lot with the um, imagery components to date, and there is a lot of discussion of how could we feed information on new construction, you know, starting now. Um, to help them with their processes in 2030, and definitely their knowledge and expertise in helping us establish the program. Um, production plans, we would definitely have a contract in place for our image sources. Um, we would like the analysis performed in-house, but we know that's going to take um, some special skill sets that we have through our current contract vehicle with Reveal Global, where we do have that expertise in satellite imagery. We would want to bring that on board, but if not, we would definitely keep the contract in place to keep that. Um, 
we're looking at probably a team of maybe 10 to 12 to keep this going for the program. And then there would be additional um, MassVAT support for this. So the MassVAT and then the IT support would probably bring us closer to 20 people. Well, thank you. You answered everything. <laughs> Sorry. It's early on in the process, as you know, Jeff, and we're looking to you and to others to kind of help us make these decisions along the way. Well, you're, you're going down a good path, so keep it up. I appreciate it. You, you have been a tremendous help. You and the CSAC working group have just helped us immensely, so I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. This is Allison Plyer. I see that we um, that Deborah Ball has her hand raised. Go ahead, Deborah. Uh, hi. <clears throat> yes, this is Deborah Ball. I, I apologize if this was answered and I didn't quite hear, but I was just wondering whether the um, <clears throat> the algorithms for um, uh, some of this work is different in rural er areas than urban areas, partly because some of the issues, in fact, are different in those areas, like the detection issues and getting in the very Remote locations in rural areas is one area where satellite imagery in particular can be really, really valuable, but it's also where its detection is sometimes weakest. And then in urban areas, I'm wondering in particular how you're dealing with like permits that are um, in place, new construction and so forth in place where existing construction already is and whether the satellite imagery, I didn't see how that's being dealt with. And, and it's an interesting issue partly because some of the commercial databases like the Zillow type data I think it has a, um, a year built variable, for example, that they use in their thing, but it's not year rebuilt. And that's a really interesting component to understanding urban change that um, can perhaps also get at some of how the census reclassifies areas from urban to rural. I mean, this, this information can downstream help other products. And anyhow, that's the end of my comment. And if you have any um, you know, response to them, and I apologize again if it was already addressed. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, we are absolutely looking at different algorithms for rural versus urban that is in our framework that is actually being worked on as we speak. And the Zillow component is a great um, lead into we are that is one of our alternative data sources that we're looking at our um, our counterparts at BEA have uh, allowed us to work with them on the Zillow data of what was brought in and made available. So we are working on that as well as one of our alternative data sources. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Deborah. Um, and Kunal. Uh, hi, this is uh, Kunal Delvar. Uh, yeah, first of all, this seems like Really cool work, and I'm, I'm amazed to see the state-of-the-art uh, image uh, recognition technology being used here. Uh, I just had a couple of comments. So first, I guess is uh, the commercial map services like Google Maps and others do seem to have lot boundaries in many cases, and I wonder if you could use the same sources as they are using to uh, to do the segmentation of the large images into into actual lots rather than these tags. Uh, okay. And I guess the second comment I had was that I, this area of kind of understanding images, uh, convolutional or other neural networks is a really fast moving field. And uh, I guess I, I strongly believe that given current technology, you could definitely get to real time uh, relatively easily. Uh, it shouldn't take uh, 13 minutes to process 10,000 images uh, if we can leverage uh, some of the more advanced hardware uh, that's available for this. And I wonder if you've explored using the cloud services that provide tools gets to do these things uh, faster and, uh, and better. Sure. So we have looked a little bit at the Google Maps and we can certainly continue to explore the boundary segmentations with their technology. Our um, IT team um, that's headed up by Sumit is actually looking at the best way for us moving forward. Him with our reveal contractors are looking at many opportunities with IT infrastructure. I think at this point, it's more of us in a research form deciding how we're going to move forward with what exactly the alternative data sources are, what our models and algorithms are going to look like. 
They're in the background working on this technology to help us expedite as we start to pick the solutions, the data feeds, and uh, which algorithms and things of that nature we would employ. Excellent. Um, this is Alison Plyer again. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, exact numbers will click. That's all of our questions and comments. So, um, I mean, maybe we should move on. Okay. Thank you very much, Stephanie and Jeff, uh, for the presentation and discussion and, and, and others. And now for our final presentation, uh, but perhaps I should mention that uh, it's very likely that this uh, presentation will overlap with the public comments, so I will very likely need to interrupt. Our final presenters of the day, Rebecca Hutchinson and Scott Sluter, will take up to 20 minutes to present new model monthly state level retail sales product, and that will be followed by a discussant, Krishna Rao and committee discussion up to 10 minutes. Uh, please remember, I, I will very likely need to interrupt. All right, I guess Rebecca's coming back again. So, Rebecca? <laughs> thanks, Tommy. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, thanks. Good afternoon. I am Rebecca Hutchinson from the Economic Indicator Division, and I'm joined by Scott Schuler, who is also in the Indicator Division. Today, Scott and I will be sharing an update on another Census Bureau experimental data product, the monthly state retail sales. And we also have Jenny Thompson, the lead methodologist on this project, and Deanna Widenhammer, the production math mathematical statistician for this data available for questions. Next slide, please. These state-level data are some of the most requested data from our data users, and we were really excited to finally release these data at the end of September 2020, especially since the retail sector has been so impacted by the pandemic and providing our data users retail information at more granular geographies was a priority for us. Previously, state-level retail sales information was only available once every five years as part of the economic census. And the high cost of survey collection and respondent burden has made survey-based state-level retail sales difficult and costly to obtain. So these data are modeled and they did not require any new data collection. This is the first version of these experimental data. We plan to refine the series and we have invited data users to provide feedback on how to improve this experimental product or on potential third-party data sources that could be used in the creation of these data. Our data users have already provided us with quite a bit of feedback since September, and we will be highlighting some of that feedback in a later slide. Next slide. So what are we publishing? We are publishing year-over-year -year percentage changes for each state and the District of Columbia for total retail sales, excluding non-store retailers, as well as for 11 of the retail subsectors as classified by the North American Industry Classification System, or NAIC. Some of these published subsectors include motor vehicle and parts dealers, food and beverage stores, and gasoline stations. At this time, we are not publishing food services, but we do hope to do so in the future. We are also not publishing non-store retailers, which is NAICS 454. Non-store retailers are primarily e-commerce type businesses, and the best method and data sources needed to attribute e-commerce sales to state geographies is a bigger challenge that we still need to work through. For those NAICs that we are publishing, though, we are providing year-over-year -year percentage changes back to January 2019. And these state-level data are not adjusted for seasonal variation, trading day differences, moving holidays, or price changes. And we do hope to publish levels in the future as well. The next slide, please. The state level retail estimates are created using a composite model that is a weighted average of synthetic estimates and hybrid estimates. The weight used is a ratio of the variance of the synthetic estimates to the total variance of both estimates. So the synthetic estimates, which are on the left side of this slide, 
make use of survey data from our monthly retail trade survey and administrative data in the form of payroll. The hybrid estimates, which are explained on the right side of this slide, use third-party data and, again, survey data from our monthly retail trade survey, as well as modeled establishment level data. The hybrid estimator is flexible and can incorporate additional third-party data. So the third-party data can either be sales by individual store locations for a retailer, or it can be aggregated state-level sales data for a curated list of retailers. At this time, our requirement for the third-party data is that we know which retailers are included in the data. There may be potential to use other third-party data where we don't know the specific retailer composition, but that would be a long-term improvement to the product. The next slide, please. Now, there are some limitations to this methodology. First, both the synthetic and hybrid estimates are based on the assumption that there's a strong relationship between retail sales and total annual payroll. There are also additional limitations to the hybrid estimator. We do not impute for retailers with a single store location that are not in our monthly retail survey. And instead, we account for them using a national industry level adjustment factor. Please keep in mind that these state retail data are experimental and they may not meet all of the quality standards of our official statistical products. Uh, the next slide. But to allow our data users to better assess the quality of the data, we do provide a variety of quality metrics with each publication. Each monthly publication includes the standard errors and a coverage metric to provide some indication of how much directly collected data from either our monthly retail survey or from a third-party data is included in the estimates. Uh, the quality of the model improves um, with better coverage. And on the next slide, please. You can see the coverage varies by three-digit retail subsector. Again, coverage is based on survey data and third-party data. The survey data used in this coverage calculation is for retailers that have a single store location or for retailers that operate more than one store location, but all of those store locations are in the same state. We currently only have one third-party data source from a point-of-sale data aggregator, but we are working to obtain other data sources to improve coverage across the subsectors. Right now, as you can see on the slide, we have excellent coverage in NICS 452. Uh, we have compared all of these coverage rates to the coverage rates of similar estimates that we have access to that are created by private companies. And our coverage is similar, if not better, than the coverage rates in those data products. And now I'm going to turn it over to Scott to share some of the data. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, you know, once, our, once our methodologist came up, approach to how we were going to create the data, one of the things we wanted to do was validate it against external sources, uh, you know, sure that the data uh, seems reasonable and uh, get a kind of a perspective on, on where the data might differ. So what we did is we compared against two primary sources. One was, was a third-party data source, and second were publicly available data from the states themselves. So first we compared to a third-party credit card payment processing company that also produces monthly sales by state. And that company also uses our national data as a benchmark and input to their models. Um, we have done comparisons by checking the data uh, against the confidence intervals that we produce with our estimates to help validate the comparability and see how they generally align. Um, and we uncovered that basically the, the data aligned fairly well, um, although we did, you know, in certain circumstances, uncover data which could be uh, viewed as potential outliers, possibly on either side. Additionally, we, know we were able to compare data to some states themselves. Um, five states produce uh, state revenue data by, on a monthly basis. Um, we go into a couple of these examples here in a second, but uh, we were able to kind of make use of some of this data uh, more directly as a, as a proxy for what the states feel their revenue is uh, by sector. 
So if we go to the next slide, we'll take a look at some of that data. So Kansas, Mississippi, and Nevada are presented here, and each of these three release data on a monthly basis. Uh, in the graphs shown here, the purple line represents the data from the states for retail sales. The green line is the monthly state retail sales series, or our data, uh, with the salmon colored lines, that's what we call those, or, um, are representing the upper and lower competence limits on, on our trends. So this is a comparison of the year-to-year -year trends from the states, what the states are reporting, versus the year-to-year -year trend data that we are reporting in the monthly state retail sales release. Looking at this, you know, generally Kansas and Nevada line up fairly well with the trends we were showing over the past you know, almost two years, between the beginning of 2019 through toward the end of 2020. Uh, Mississippi um, is a little more variable, as you can tell. Um, and as we continue to use this data, you know, we have questions on not only the how the data differ, but you know, trying to understand the accuracy of the state data, what might cause spikes in the state data, um, you know, like in those peaks and valleys shown there in Mississippi uh, in late 2019. Uh, so as and we're trying to investigate those a little bit. But uh, Mississippi's been a, been a unique state as we've been doing our review over these months. On the next couple of slides, if we go to slide 10, we'll take a look a little bit more at the data that we are producing with as part of the monthly state retail sales uh, release. Slide 10, this slide here, shows the total. So this is our, our total retail excluding non-store. Uh, so this is representing like the total, total retail number we're publishing. And on the graphs on the next couple of slides, the blue represents the stronger or more positive estimates, and the brownish color represents the more negative estimates. On the next couple, three slides, you'll be seeing data shown for January 2020, April 2020, and October 2020. And these numbers on these individual states represent the year-over-year -year change for that individual state. So looking at you know, the top left graph, which is January 2020, you can see this is you know, basically pre-pandemic. Uh, most of the states were performing uh, you know, generally in a positive direction. Um, and then, of course, in the bottom left, you'll see the, the April 2020, which is kind of the height of the pandemic-related closures. Um, and all of the states, of course, are more the brown or more, more negative year-over-year -year trends. By October, the top right, you know, the data that we produced showed that uh, most of the states were, you know, had recovered to some degree. You can find the differing degrees of, of blue uh, probably correlate some, somewhat to the, the uh, restrictions that those states may or may not have imposed. You'll see that a little more closely on slide 11, the next slide, when we take a look at NAICS 452 or general merchandise. The general merchandise category includes things such as department stores, but it also includes things like super centers, warehouse hubs, and dollar stores. So during 2020, this industry included industry included components that have been both hurt and helped from the pandemic uh, and the changes in the spending patterns during the pandemic. In the top left, again, you'll see January 2020, um, which is the pre-pandemic estimates. And then you, if you look in the bottom left, you'll see the peak of the, the pandemic-related closures in April. Um, and you'll notice that it's not all one uniform color. Uh, some of the, the states in the middle part of the country uh, were we're showing still positive year-to-year -year trends. Um, we found this kind of interesting, and this seemed to align fairly well with uh, the lack of restrictions that were imposed in those states versus other parts of the country. Um, and then in October 2020, you can see how- Scott, Tommy Wright, I, I'm sorry, Scott, I'm going to have to interrupt you. I will pause, no problem. It is now time for public comment. During this virtual meeting, we take public comments by way of the chat feature. Comments are limited to two minutes. Anything over that may be submitted in writing for the record. When submitting your comment by way of chat, please include your name and affiliation with your comment. Uh, I have received three uh, public comments, one some time ago, one this morning, and one uh, a few minutes ago. These will all eventually be posted on the CSAC meeting page at census.gov. The Federal Register Notice located on the CSAC website provides more information for submitting written comments. I will attempt to read them all. I believe I can get through them. 
The first one has a title, Why Can't American Public Know How Many Illegal Immigrants Are Fleecing the USA Taxpayers? Now, how many illegal immigrants are fleecing the USA taxpayers? One has to wonder why you were not able to come up during Trump's term in office with where our illegal immigrants are leeching on America. I find your failure to complete the task of census that was given to you a direct violation of authority and wonder at your incompetence and intransience in not completing the work assignment of telling Americans where they have millions of illegal immigrants traipsing around America in violation of our laws. They are in violation of our laws to be here. You should be supportive of enforcing American laws instead of aiding and abetting violators of our laws. You are cog in the wheel of causing America to go down, down, down into the blanks of hell and causing America to be overrun and such actions as you did are in fact traitorous. We all need to know what is happening to our country and this failure to indicate who has a right to be here and who has violated all our rights by being here is a sore point for the majority of Americans, except those who make money on the violation of our laws. You aided and abetted them. This comment is for the public record. Please receive. It is from Gene Public. The second comment a public comment is by Adeline Wilcox. Um, remarks Michael Thiem made yesterday further convinced me that the 2020 census is a failed census. One of his slides told us, and this is a quote, it's presented as a quote, processing software was miscalculating the age of respondents if those respondents did not include the month and day of their birthday in their response, end quote. Based on my experience at the U.S. Census Bureau, only sloppy requirements development, coding, and, mis and management could bring this miscalculation about. In the late 1990s, I was a SAS developer. I worked on the American Community Survey Age Edit. Nearly 3,000 lines of spaghetti code modified from the 1990 census age edit. I tested the ACS age edit over and over. Needless to say, debugging was hard work. In the late 1990s, all supervisory programmers working on the ACS had 1990 census experience. Unlike Michael Thiem, they never offered explanations such as quote, for some reason, unquote. They spent days debugging code until they understood why it did not produce the required results. ACS supervisors didn't whine about the difficulty of anticipating response values. They developed code which handled unexpected values. No later than 1998, Darzell, chief 1990 census programmer, told me everything happens in the decennial census. I understood that to mean unexpected combinations of response bias arise. In a recent blog, Theme wrote, and this is presented as a quotation, having worked on a number of decennial censuses, the career processing staff at the Census Bureau understand that the reality for any large complex data collection is that coding is never able to anticipate every data situation no matter how well we test it, end of quote. Theme statement presents a picture of poorly planned design and testing. In 2016, the steps to proof of concept failure signal poor planning, design, management, and unreadiness for response data processing. The Census Bureau has scheduled the first 2020 ACS data release for September 23rd, 2021, ahead of the official user-friendly 2020 
Census PL 94171 data release. 2020 ACS data were also collected during the pandemic. At this late date, the pandemic doesn't explain decennial data processing delays. The ACS has working systems. Decennial staff evidently failed to thoroughly test theirs. The third uh, comment uh, is, is received by chat, and I will attempt to read. Let's see. My name is Debbie Stein. I am commenting on behalf of the Partnership of America's Children. We helped lead the Count All Kids Coalition, which worked to improve the count of young children in the 2020 decennial census. The partnership has three concerns we would like to share with the Census Bureau. First, we note that the undercount of young children, which is a big problem in the decennial census, is also a problem in the ACS and other demographic surveys. Like the decennial census, the underreporting of young children in the ACS is much higher among blacks and Hispanics than among non-Hispanic white children. We encourage the Census Bureau to focus on this issue over the next few years, particularly in the context of the ACS methods panel test. We urge the Census Bureau to focus on better rostering questions because our research shows upwards of 20% of respondents would not include their young child or are not aware that young children are supposed to be included in the census. Second, we note that early in the decennial census cycle, there appeared to be very little coordination about the count of young children among the various Census Bureau groups working on the decennial census. When the Bureau created a task force on the undercount of young children, we saw significant improvements in the operational plan, the communications plan, research design, and the overall attention to young children. We therefore suggest that the Bureau needs a permanent task force charged with coordinating the data of young children across all its decennial and demographic work. Third, we are deeply concerned about the implications of differential privacy for the count of young children. It creates significant variation in the quality of data at the local level. Research by Dr. Bill O'Hare on an earlier demonstration product that is posted on our website indicates that this may create significant artificial variation in the allocation of funding by geography. Particularly for programs that allocate funding directly from national agencies to localities, such as the Title I program for low-income schools and special education funding. We also note that this could create a major public relation crisis for the Census Bureau if neighboring communities see big differences in their federal fund allocation that have nothing to do with their changing demographics. As the Census Bureau finalizes the differential privacy methodology, we hope that it will set Epsilon at a level that protects the accuracy of children's data and children's program funding. It would be especially useful if the Census Bureau could create another updated demonstration product that includes data for children ages zero to four. A review of these data, even for a sample of counties, would allow us to assess if the recent changes reduce the errors introduced by differential privacy in critical data about children. We also are very concerned that in the context of differential privacy, the Central Bureau hasn't yet figured out how to report data that connects children with the adults in the household so that we can't tell whether the children are living with married parents, single parents, other relatives, or foster children. These situations are critical for understanding child well-being. I'm sorry, I have one more item. Finally, in the CSAC presentation on the PES yesterday, there was acknowledgement of the issue of correlation bias in the estimates of coverage error for young children. Are staff still exploring possible methods to correct for this bias? Has the Census Bureau asked the CSAC for input on this issue? Has the Bureau asked the National Academy of Science to examine this problem? Has the Bureau assembled a subject matter expert group to focus 
on this issue. Are there other comments from the public? Hearing All right, this is Sean LeBain. All right. Yes. Since our public comment period is 20 minutes, we will leave the chat feature open until 2.15. If you'd like to go back to presentations, we can, and right. then we can circle back. That, that sounds like a very good suggestion, and we will do that. And, and thank you very much, Shauna. And uh, Scott, it's back to you. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, we'll start back at slide 11. That will be heard, please. It's just a moment, Scott. Sure, no worries. And Scott, if you could speak a little louder, that would be helpful. Just a little bit, just a little. Okay. Can we'll we take the slides back to the previous presentation? Yes, Scott. Yes. Thank you. There we go. Thank you, Scott. Okay, so. Uh, just to recap where, where we were, so we were looking at the general merchandise category and we were comparing the January, April, and October of 2020 results. <clears throat> uh, unlike the previous slide, you know, I was pointing out that in the April data and in the October data, uh, the performance by state was not as uniform. Uh, this is an indus a, uh, industry, general merchandise, that uh, we have, as Rebecca pointed out, the best coverage at greater than 50% across States. So um, we felt that this was was a um, an interesting perspective on how the different parts of the country performed throughout not only the pandemic but as they were recovering uh, into the fall. Slide, the next slide we look at gasoline stations. Uh, gasoline, you know, same three graphs: the pre-pandemic in January, uh, and this and the. Uh, during the height of the pandemic in April and then, and then uh, more of the recovery period in October. These, these graphs are a reminder of a couple of things. One, that the data on the monthly retail trade survey is, um, is nominal in nature, and as a result, so is the data on the monthly state retail sales series. So, you know, in April, obviously, there were drops in uh, price and, and, and demand, and as a result, um, you know, much of the, uh, the nation moved negative. And then in October, you can see that it, that it continued that way. It will be interesting to see how this looks when we publish the early months of 2021 as the, uh, you know, as the gas prices are returning to more normal and obviously demand is increasing over time. So and to the next slide, you know, as, as you know, the, working on this project, it's been, it's been a lot of fun and a lot of, uh, very rewarding for the team in terms of like putting together these retail geographic estimates. Uh, so, you know, then you release the data and you hope people externally to you feel the same way. Um, as Rebecca said, it is something we've heard that was in, in demand and when we've talked to users over the years. Uh, this, this slide shows just a few examples of some, some comments we received. Uh, we, we had, um, you know, we, we got you know, some compliments on the data we were including, and of course we got some suggestions on what people want to see. People want to see you know, county level data. People you know, would like to see levels in addition to trends, uh, NAICS 722. But you know, we found some of these were, were more interesting. You know, we had an educator talk about how they were gonna, you know, using, using the data uh, with his undergraduate course, his or her undergraduate course, you know, we had state representative using the data. So this was, this was very, this was, uh, this made all of us feel uh, that we had done a pretty good job of, on, on what we were trying to achieve because we did get quick and, and very positive feedback. Of course, you know, we don't want to rest on our laurels. So we were looking ahead on the next slide. You know, there are a few things that are on our to-do list. Um, you know, we want to try to figure out a way to allocate the e-commerce sales and the other parts of non-store retail so that we can provide more of a full retail picture. Uh, we are also agree with a lot of our users that we want to produce the state levels in addition to the year-over-year -year percent changes. And we want to incorporate more third-party data to, um, 
to, to help improve the estimates. So. so with that in mind, we did have a couple of questions uh, for the committee on the next slide. So some things that we were interested in. One, are there other data sources that come to mind when you see this that might be of use as we move forward? Are there improvements you think we could make to the model to make the data more useful to those in your specific uh, industry or you or your colleagues in your various areas of expertise? And now that we've stabilized this, the production of this data, we're, we're, we're trying to expand the outreach uh, and promote the data. We've reached out to some of our retail trade association uh, contacts about promoting the data to the various state retail associations and the state chamber of commerce. And, um, could also be a good outreach step, but uh, who else comes to mind uh, that you think could be a good user of this data? So with that, I, I will turn it over, I guess, to Krishna, who will be discussing. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, well, excited to, to talk about this um, kind of new product coming up the census. Uh, I'm going to start by apologizing. I, I took advantage of this uh, being a remote session to join yesterday from kind of outside my lawn and my allergy just flared up a little bit. So sorry if I a, a sneeze or two sneaks in. Um, maybe to start, we can move to the, to the next slide. Uh, I, you know, I may want to, um, you know, I think by virtue of all of us being on CSAC, it's probably fair to characterize us all as kind of census super fans in some sense or another. And I think kind of this effort is so for me, just a, a good reminder of just like how much cool stuff is going on in the census and kind of, you know, it fits with the theme of kind of innovation and really pushing the envelope that we've seen throughout a lot of the presentations the last couple of days. You know, this, this work is uh, it's just super cool. It closes a huge hole um, in data availability at a more granular level around retail sales. You know, that's always an important topic, um, but as kind of some of the year-on-year -year changes data that Scott was able to walk through shows, you know, Due to COVID, this is kind of there's an intense focus um, on what's going on, kind of you know both shifts to e-commerce, but then also just like you know the charts about you know Nevada retail sales month by month. You know you can just very clearly see the impacts uh, in ways that, that feel really important for um, policy making, uh, decision making by firms, institutions. So just um, really want to applaud the census for kind of seeing a, a clear hole and then doing their best to fill that hole even though it's, you know, candidly, there's a reason the hole was there. It's hard. We don't, these surveys are expensive. We can't do them with the granularity and frequency that we'd like to all the time. So how do we kind of uh, utilize third-party data and some kind of clever methodological um, techniques to try to get as close as we can to, to filling that gap? Uh, and then the, the last one here on the slide, the kind of last paragraph, there's also kind of a uh, – I hadn't seen this previously with other census products – there's kind of a, a cool new set of interactive kind of iframe visualizations on the actual monthly uh, state retail sales that allow you those graphs that um, Scott walked through. You know, if you're a user, it's, you know, 10 seconds to go kind of peruse some of those graphs and check them out for your, your favorite um, sector or your favorite state. So we encourage all the community members to go kind of play around with that if you have a minute or two. Who would mind moving to the next slide? Uh, yeah, I, want, I wanted to start off with a few questions for kind of the, the subject matter experts. Uh, I think, you know, some of these um, were a little bit addressed during the presentation. We might have a good circle and back to. Um, the, the first question I had was kind of on the kind of creation of the composite in, uh, index, which, as the presentation explained, it's, it's kind of weighting a synthetic and a hybrid component. Um, and my, my intuition here, not having seen kind of the raw data, is that those weights matter a lot. Uh, because I'm guessing the synthetic um, estimates, you know, provide a lot of stability in the data, but then there's kind of this, like, very strong assumption about the kind of link between monthly retail sales and employment, uh, like kind of payroll level data, and that's kind of those ratios staying constant. Um, and at least in kind of my, my understanding of uh, the weighting scheme, you know, the, the weights on those two different components are based on kind of the share of total variance. Uh, which makes sense as an approach because we don't have much to ground truth with here, but it, it is kind of a, you know, it's, it's primarily looking to kind of aim the kind of a second moment type uh, target because we, yeah, we don't have ground truth. So we, we do in some states, right? There are some states and sectors where we do have these kind of granular level 
uh, data available, not that's kind of full coverage, it would be interesting to understand, you know, if we use kind of an alternative um, kind of composite weighting methodology that uh, for those specific states and sectors, how different are those weights that would come out of that uh, estimation procedure versus the estimation procedure that underlies the actual data currently? So that's kind of one question for the subject matter experts. The, the other question I, I had around was kind of the, the length of the time series. Um, you know, we have, we have these monthly retail trade reports going back to kind of the early 90s, but this, uh, the state level series is available back to kind of January 2019. Um, it's, it's super useful, but obviously, you know, retail sales are a very seasonally driven uh, uh, series. And so even if they are able to kind of release levels, you know, it's going to be hard to recover seasonal trends without much of a history. Um, so I, I was kind of wondering what the, what was the missing factor in substance that allowed us to pull this back closer to when we started to do some of these uh, early 90s uh, retail trade reports? Because I think that would be just super valuable to be able to um, decompose seasonality out from other trends we might see. We, can we skip to the next slide? And then I wanted, yeah, there, there was a set of questions that um, Scott brought up. Yeah, sure, so at the start, that was, it was a great presentation by kind of Scott and Rebecca, and there were a number of questions directed at the at CSAC to try to help with. Uh, the first one on additional data sources. I think here, this is, I think Rebecca spoke to this directly, but maybe would, would love a little bit more color. You know, I think the kind of um, monthly point of sales data we're using um, in the hybrid uh, estimation here, you know, I, I think it's a pretty concentrated sample of companies that we're getting that data from. I think uh, it's, it's, you know, only not much more than a handful or so. Uh, and I think it skews pretty um, towards kind of larger companies. Retail sales are obviously, you know, it's an industry with a pretty long tail that, you know, maybe that tail is declining a little bit, but it certainly feels very important. So I was wondering if kind of there's um, – an ability to kind of go after from, you know, other vendors or other sources, uh, data that captures a little bit more kind of the small and medium business sector. I think that might be important. And they might have kind of trends in those sectors that look distinct from what we might find if we just concentrated in kind of the um, larger kind of more national establishments. Uh, in terms of specific improvements, yeah, so we already talked a little bit about seasonality. That was kind of the main, uh, the, the main kind of uh, improvement uh, that, that seemed uh, useful. I think the, the other ones they've heard that they've already, I think they, the team already has kind of the right sets of next steps that um, Scott outlined and is getting great feedback from much of the user groups and kind of the rave reviews that were, that were shown on those slides. And, and on that, you know, um, we'd love to kind of open up to more broadly to kind of all of CSAC to kind of point to organizations that have benefit from this data, you know, but obviously I think, you know, um, kind of state-level governments, retail industry kind of firms and groups, economic forecasting shops. I mean, this is, as I said at the outset, this is data that's uh, super valuable and has never um, really been available as broadly kind of uh, through a public census product. So I think there are lots of lots of uses because, because to my knowledge, lots of the other proxies for this sort of data are um, either not very reliable or, or uh, expensive uh, for, for some agencies and organizations to access. And that, I think, was my last slide on comments. So maybe I'll, I'll turn it back over either to the, the SNACs or to, to Allison. Yeah, so, um, this is Allison. If, if um, Rebecca or Scott would like to answer some of Krishna's questions. Sure, this is Rebecca Hutchinson. Um, for the methodology questions, um, I am going to ask um, either Jenny Thompson or Deanna Weidenhammer. They should be on the line if they could um, answer that question for us. If we could go back to Krishna's slides and bring the questions up, I think that would be helpful. Um, back one more. Uh, Deanna or Jenny, are you there? Yeah, I was hoping, I'm here, I don't know about Deanna. I was hoping you could pull up, go back one more slide if you don't mind. Okay, great. So I don't know if Deanna wants to answer these questions, um, but I can at least start. I'm Jenny Thompson. I was um, involved in developing the methodology for these estimates, and then Deanna took over, so she gets the really messy data anomalies now. So that's um, she has much the much larger share of challenges than I did. Um, but I want to step back and talk a little bit about the weighting to begin with. Um, so. 
I agree. Traditionally speaking, with composite estimators, you try to reduce the mean squared error. Um, of course, to do that, you sort of have you have to know what the expected value of your statistic is, and we don't. And now you did point out there are some states where we're using primarily purchased or um, directly collected data. To be fair, we didn't know about that when we started, so that's one issue. But the second larger issue is um, validation. We did a lot of data validation in everybody's favorite months, March 2020, April 2020, and May 2020. And what we found for those 22 companies for which we had directly purchased establishment data, that when we linked them to the MRTS data, we had some very big differences. And this sort of led us into that rabbit hole of which was more reliable, the directly purchased data or the census data. We really couldn't tell. Um, in some cases, we had large negative estimates from one source versus the other. That's always a challenging thing to think about with retail sales. But it did sort of convince us not to try to pursue MSC. Um, knowing which estimate is closer to the truth is a little bit more challenging. And we do incorporate the belief in the relative reliability by the less we impute, the more we tend to, um, the weighting tends to favor the hybrid estimate. So I'm gonna pause and see if that made any sense. And then I have more questions, I have more answers. Yeah, no, that, that was uh, that was perfect. Yeah, I think I, I uh, okay. yeah, clarifies. Yeah, I mean, believe me, we wanted to do the other. Um, one other thing to bring up is that that sort of touches a little bit on the seasonality as well. That we do not capture in any way, shape, or form the seasonality, seasonal effects with that synthetic estimator. You know, we are basically just prorating down to the the seasonal effects for the national industry estimate down to the states. We missed that completely. And so this hybrid composite estimator does lose that. Um, what it does is it sort of tamps down um, wildly variable hybrid estimates because we have a lot of a random effect in, our, um, in that hybrid estimator model. So it, it keeps the estimates from getting uncontrolled, but we do lose some of that seasonality. So that is a, a flaw, not one that we know how to answer, however. Um, the other thing I'll mention is one of our big problem areas is when we have, um, and again, this is our three favorite months, April, May, and oh no, March, April, and May 2020. Um, we would have estimates for which we had really very reliable direct estimates in the previous year, and not so much in those three years. And so the compositing would actually change. In um, 2020, those estimates would be more likely to be heavily weighted towards the synthetic estimate. And in 2019, they would be more heavily weighted towards the hybrid. And those change estimates ended up often being suppressed because you were comparing apples and oranges. Um, I don't think there was anything else that went into. I might let Deanna answer some of these questions as well. Okay, yeah, hi, I'm on the line as well. I know you, you were talking, so I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, so yeah, this is Deanna Weidenhammer. Um, I, I think you touched on a lot of the concerns with the seasonality approach. The question about the limitations of going further back, uh, we chose, and to the best of my knowledge, starting with the year-to-year -year changes starting in 2019 due to the start of the current monthly retail trade sample. Uh, that started in uh, the beginning of 2018. So that put our monthly level estimates on the same basis for us to use to generate, or generate those trends. Um, the complications of going further back, obviously, uh, the further back in time it is, the harder it is to capture what the true population frame would look like. Um, so I think that would be something we would need to research further. Um, and I don't know if, if I covered everything, uh, Scott and Rebecca, from your side that you had uh, in terms of the going further back. Um, I think that was good. This is Rebecca Hutchinson. Um, Deanna, I thought you covered that answer well. Um, and thank you, Jenny, as well. The last question I can take is related to the alternative data sources. Um, if you could go forward one slide, I think this question's on the next slide. Um, we are using the point of sale data. Um, we had got this data to address uh, 
a non-response and respondent burden uh, effort with our monthly retail trade survey. And as part of that data, we, we received store level data that really worked well for the early stages of these state level retail estimates. But um, one thing, and I think Scott highlighted this quite a bit, a big priority for us right now is finding additional data sources and finding, you know, these data sources that um, capture the retail activity in these, these like smaller businesses that maybe won't show up in these point of sale data sets. So I think you, you got exactly where we're going in our next steps with this data set, with this question. Um, and so I, if anyone has any suggestions, as Scott said, we are completely open to other um, data sets that might be helpful for this effort. Did you have any other questions related to that or have we hit all of your good questions? No, thank you, that was, that was super comprehensive. Thank you, thank you all. Great, so now I just need to see if any other CSEC members have any questions or comments. Not oh, Jay Bright, go ahead, Jay. Thanks, Allison. This is Jay Bright. Um, I'm a little um, confused. I, I don't know the nature of the MRTS survey, but if it is a nationally represented survey with sample sizes within states that are just too small to give useful direct estimates, I'm wondering if you considered a traditional small area estimation approach with those noisy but unbiased small area, uh, sorry, direct estimates, uh, then put into a small area estimation routine with mean square error estimates using traditional methodology. So the, the question is, did you consider a traditional small area estimation technique using direct estimates as functions of these um, other covariates? Thank you. The answer, I'm gonna answer that one. Oh, we tried very hard. The answer is no, we did not. We tried, but we couldn't do it. We considered it, but we don't have large area estimates in each state. We don't have sample in every single state and every single industry. We had large chunks of missing. The waiting for all of the MRTS sample is to produce national estimates. So um, we have that issue as well. But we, we actually spent the first two months of this project trying to produce small area estimates before we just had to abandon it. Okay, so those traditional techniques don't actually require sample in every small area. They're borrowing strength across areas, but mm -hmm. I, that it was so sparse you just couldn't even kind of get off the ground? No, we really couldn't. Um, that is, we, you know, and all of us agree that would be the way to go. And in fact, as we're talking about redesigning the um, surveys, that is something we want to keep in mind. We would like to be able to have um, more reliable direct estimates so that we could go that route. It's just not a survey designed for that. Thank you. And when you add in non-response, it becomes even worse. Great, thank you all. Um, any other CSAC members? Let's see. Now, any other questions? I do not see any other questions. Um, so I think we can move along, which is great news. All right, Allison. Uh, it looks like we're close to being on schedule. Uh, for most of us, while the committee members take a break, uh, and, and Allison will direct how that break is going to occur, but uh, the most of the committee will break up into small subgroups to work on uh, formulating uh, recommendations. Uh, but for most of us, we will uh, disappear until 4.30. At 4.30, uh, the, the committee will come back together again and uh, present uh, its recommendations. Allison, do you want to say something specific to the committee? Yes, if committee members could um, join the Skype groups um, in five minutes. Um, at least especially the hosts of each, um, that would be great. And then um, if we can... Oh, so this is Shauna. Keep in mind, you'll go into your host room if, if you want to talk only to your committee. Okay. You want to do that? 
that's fine. Okay. We'll so, Tommy, we'll take a break now and we'll reconvene at 4.30. That's correct, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Allison. Welcome back. I would now like to turn the call back over to Tommy Wright. Mr. Wright, you may now begin, sir. Thank you. Tommy Wright, uh, welcome back, everyone, to the 2021 CSAC Spring Virtual Meeting. Just a reminder, information for closed captioning services can be found on the CSAC website. And now, Allison Plyer, the committee chair, will now present the 2021 CSAC Spring Virtual Meeting recommendations. Allison. Great. Thank you so much, Tommy. Um, obviously, first, we want to commend um, the Census Bureau on a great meeting. Um, and we will scroll through our recommendations, which we have all um, discussed. Um, uh, we want to highlight differential privacy, even though it wasn't a topic. It's such um, it wasn't a topic on the agenda. It was such a critical one, and uh, we do um, still have concerns about particularly how and when we can make additional recommendations um, before our next meeting. Um, and so we're going to recommend that um, the Census Bureau hold a public meeting of the CSAC before June, so that the differential privacy working group can present some draft recommendations um, to the CSAC, and CSAC can make official recommendations about differential privacy um, before the privacy loss, loss budget decisions are made. Um, so just so, so everybody knows, that is not off our radar by any means. Um, the 2020 Census Operational Review was excellent. Um, we really appreciate the transparency uh, that the Census Bureau provided. Um, we have a few recommendations about looking at areas that had differential self-response uh, in particular, you know, we noticed that um, rural areas um, had lower self-response, especially those that had uh, larger shares of people of color, and really better understanding why that is. Um, have, are those folks, do they have less um, media outlets reaching them, uh, you know, fewer nonprofits operating there that may be part of the partnership program, et cetera? Looking into that is important. We also um, want to recommend, um, you know, obviously we're interested in the quality metrics that the census will be producing, which we've mentioned before. We uh, want to look at, um, you know, the uh, internet self-response interface um, and see how it operated. Um, we know it was great and we're excited about that and we really commend the Census Bureau and um, think that there could be a little bit more intel about um, what worked and maybe what could be improved for future. And then, um, you know, looking at other censuses, country census innovations would be useful and also, you know, what's going to happen in 2030? Is it going to be person-based or household-based? Um, and whether there will be greater use of administrative records. post enumeration data processing status. Um, I'm not even going to get into all these details. It's, you know, it's obviously it was unfortunate that, you know, it got kind of munched <laughs> because of the pandemic. Um, munched is the wrong word, so don't don't any y'all quote me on that one. But, uh, <laughs> ooh, there's a lot of feedback, um, but uh, obviously it was interrupted and that, and that was problematic. So, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm skipping away ahead. P forgive me. Post enumeration data processing status, um, not post enumeration survey. So we so we um, gave some comments on that. Reiterating some of what Jay Bright said during the meeting, so I won't uh, bother to read this, but he talked about bug sniffing software that could be useful to test. Um, and then obviously um, uh, making sure that, you know, what kind of um, guardrails can be put into place to, so that in, fu in future, the Bureau always has sufficient time to do its full battery of checks. Um, so that we don't get this kind of truncation of, uh, or threatened truncation of data processing time. Um, and we're delighted that um, the Census Bureau has been sharing data with the ASA folks, um, as well as obviously the JSON review of uh, processes. Um, and um, I'm really happy that the Bureau is working closely with outside experts, uh, and that's always really hopeful for, helpful for um, Transparency. Anomalies, we love anomalies. Officially, the CSAC loves anomalies. We expect anomalies. There's nothing wrong with anomalies. We're delighted that the Census Bureau identified the anomalies and um, addressed them. That's the most important thing. Um, and we had a number of suggestions about how to uh, really dig into those in a little more detail. 
um, some of these Jay said during his presentation. Um, uh, we're concerned about sort of how people understand usual residents. Um, and of course, especially because of the pandemic and the way it moved people into our, our, our sort of catalyzed movement. Um, college students, snowbirds especially, um, we, we think a uh, deeper look at understanding what, uh, where they usually live and how they understand that question is important and um, that might le lead to some revised guidance for respondents and enumerators. Um, and particularly, we'd like to see um, a one-way briefing um, or a presentation at the fall meeting about the efforts to correctly count college students and snowbirds once, only once, and in the right place for the 2020 census. Um, and moving on then to post-enumeration survey, obviously, as I was saying before, it got, um, portions of it were delayed, and that's, you know, causing some problems that the Census Bureau identified. Uh, we have some, some recommendations here and observations about um, uh, sex ratios and how they uh, how they were used and how they might be used, um, and then um, would like the bureau to think about um, lessons from the 2020 effort to improve the counts of young children in other surveys like American Community Survey under count of um, young children, which is pervasive in all their surveys. Um, so we understand and concur with um, what one of the public commenters said about. Um, the challenges and the importance of, of, of good data about young children, not just in the 2020 census, but in all of the census's surveys. Mm -hmm. Let's see, and um, we concur with the suggestion of the Partnership for America's Children to establish a task force that will focus on data for young children across the varied Census Bureau programs. I'm gonna put zero in there, and I might, uh, I wanted to just point that out. Um, I, I, Chris, I think you added that based on that comment from the public commenter, which is great. Um, if any, I agree with that. If any CSEC members um, have a concern, please um, state that we didn't have a chance to talk about that out loud, but um, I think that's a great recommendation. Um, let's see. We're also concerned about, you know, how disclosure avoidance is going to be applied to um, one, the estimation, and two, the publication of the components of census coverage. Um, uh, also, you know, looking too much at net uh, coverage, um, you know, might be too much of an emphasis um, and, and cause us to overlook inaccuracies in population subgroups. Um, so looking at gross error could be very helpful. Um, and uh, we just we are recommending that the Census Bureau produce a document that describes how they plan to use estimates of correct enumerations, erroneous enumerations by type and whole person enumerations and omissions. And then the population estimates program, which is um, still very much a work in progress, and we just applaud the Census Bureau for sharing with us their initial thoughts on this. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to weigh in on this. It's such an important topic. Um, and we appreciate that they're being very proactive and, uh, and thinking about innovations and how to uh, develop these important estimates, um, especially given some of the challenges with the census, the 2020 census, and, and, and particularly what might differential privacy do to the 2020 census that might affect the population estimates. Um, everybody probably knows population estimates are critical for state and, and um, federal funding distribution, all kinds of planning efforts, and they control the ACS. So um, really important stuff and appreciate um, the Census Bureau thinking innovatively about how they're going to produce those. Um, like the idea that um, of creating the blended base for the vintage 2021 estimates, um, you know, given that um, 2020 data might not be available in time, and um, you know, uh, we'll be really interested in learning more about um, how um, the PEP folks decide to create that blended base. Um, if there might be other external data sources um, that they might explore utilizing, other and more administrative records. Um, and then, you know, would would that blended base be used for 
future vintages if necessary, um, and how would that decision be made? Um, and then, of course, you know, uh, skipping down a little bit, um, uh, thinking about how differential privacy is going to affect um, the PEP is a, a big, big question, um, and that we'll we'll all want to know more about that. Um, and then, lastly, um, the challenge program uh, for PEP. This is um, a really great time to start to think about what might make sense for challenges going forward. Um, you know, if typically what the or if what in the last decade the census has done is it has been released the components of change to the challengers, are those components of change going to have going to be subject to differential privacy? Right. So then, if you know a, a small town is told, well, we have a record of 1,500 births in your town, and uh, the town can produce 1,600 birth certificates, and the reason for the difference was differential privacy. Well, now what? How is that going to work? Um, so those are going to be some important issues. Um, given that the housing unit data will be held invariant um, under uh, the differential privacy, you know, the housing unit method, you know, could be a really appropriate uh, way um, for the Census Bureau to start um, accepting challenges again at the county level. Um, you know, you all have heard me say about um, the very important and uh, successful challenge that the city of New Orleans did back between um, uh, the 2020 10 censuses after the city was hit by Katrina and depopulated and repopulated. And, you know, we got the, we got the estimate to within 6% of, of the 2010 count. Otherwise it would have been 22% below and nobody wants their city to be 22% underestimated after a disaster. So, um, you know, we suggest, we recommend that, uh, the, the sense that, um, the, the PEP folks, uh, test the performance of the housing unit method. Um, and consider expanding the scope of the challenge program at the county level to allow for challenges using housing unit method. And um, also working closely with the FSCPE, to use another acronym, <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris, again, um, uh, the fe federal state cooperative program um, for local population estimates to really strategize about um, maybe making unprotected data available to a working group of those, of those partners to help um, with the evaluation of DP impacts on population estimates and um, strategies for mitigating that impact um, and collaborating on the challenge program. And um, just really commend um, the, the, um, the SMEs, the, the subject matter experts in this area for the work that they're doing to be innovative and proactive in thinking this through. Um, and obviously, they need more information about um, differential privacy and how, and how it's going to affect the data they'll have access to. Okay, moving on to Jason. Um, it was um, a quick turnaround study. Congratulations to the Jason group on that. Um, very important. Um, of course, we agree with the recommendation of the group. Um, and, uh, you know, the Bureau uh, needed extra time to complete in this work accurately. And um, we're glad that the current timeline is, a, it is an, an enabling them to do that. Um, there were obviously a lot of new innovations and challenges in the 2020 census, and um, some of them could be leading to undercounts, uh, particularly in certain groups. Um, we know that IRS data um, could help reduce undercounts for tax filers, but not for others. Um, and, you know, self-response rates are higher, uh, certainly for those um, with more Internet access than savvy. So, um, you know, the Bureau uh, should be careful to not rely solely on overall quality estimates, but to really critically look at um, response rates and types of response by various geographic, demographic, and economic subgroups. Um, both the internal quality checks that are currently ongoing and the post enumeration survey would benefit from measuring and reporting quality across various subgroups that could be disparately impacted by the unique circumstances of this decennial. Oh, I can think I don't need Mario's name right there. Okay. Um, the Frames Project is so exciting. Really excellent that you guys are diving into thinking this through. Um, I won't uh, spend a lot of time articulating all this, but I'm just going to slowly scroll so you can um, Folks can read what we've got here, uh, a technical briefing on how the frames are envisioned and, um, and about our envisioning receiving and processing data. 
uh, will be helpful. Um, and, and we'd love to get more involved in providing some feedback. It sounded like the folks working on it would like our, would like our feedback. Um, so let's see, I'll just scroll through. Um, yeah, one great, great recommendation is the Bureau should consider adding an equity officer to the FRAME program team. Um, to oversee and address technical issues that are sure to arise. I think this is such a great program. I think far too many people, uh, especially everybody listening to this today, probably has no idea that there are uh, a, a goodly number of people in our country and in our territories that don't have good administrative records. Um, some of people just don't have huge long paper trails like the rest of us. And, um, you know, so we need to make sure that um, it, the more we rely on administrative records, that we, we think hard about, you know, who are the folks who don't have good paper trails and for whom we need to do greater outreach to actually gather data um, so that we are not inequitable in um, leaving folks behind. Um, and that, you know, can include people born and raised in the United States. Many elderly folks do not have good paper trails. So, um, and that obviously uh, that could in include other folks as well. Um, so let's see, um, obviously publishing detailed documentation on the FRAMES program will be important for transparency and public trust. Um, and then we articulate a number of other, um, other things to, to, to consider, which I think the uh, subject matter experts will appreciate um, uh, pondering. Um, and we would like a presentation on the 2020 Administrative Record Census at a future meeting, um, which we were excited to hear um, is, exists. Okay, so let's see, <clears throat> moving on to new non-employer statistics by demographics. I mean, what was fun about today was we heard about all of the great um, Census Bureau innovations, and um, this is certainly an exciting one um, with, you know, the increase in um, uh, non-employer firms in our country, it's obviously really, really critical. Our economy is changing in dramatic ways, just as our household structures are changing in dramatic ways. And um, this is a great new data product to help us better understand a large portion of our economy and how it's functioning. So um, we have some, uh, some observations about that. Um, and then, you know, there might be some interesting um, getting some of this data with a, a, a less of a lag time, given uh, uh, the, the changes, the rapid changes to our economy during the pandemic. Um, let's see, well, yeah, Schedule C's. We have, um, we have some personal um, pet peeves with the Schedule C <laughs> and recognize that that data um, doesn't always uh, reflect um, actual non-employer businesses. So uh, we uh, recommend that the Census Bureau explore uh, whether the Schedule C data that they receive um, from the IRS would allow um, differentiation between actual non-employer businesses and, and others and develop plans to report statistics that differentiate between them. Um, and uh, John Chagy, is that last sentence correct? Develop plans to report statistics that differentiate between businesses and non-business non-employers? That's right, yeah. That's right. Okay, great. Um, business formation statistics. Um, CSAC appreciates the work being done here, ongoing. Um, and it could be a really great economic indicator going forward. Um, I'm just scrolling slowly so y'all can read this. It, um, uh, Andrew Sandwick did a great job of pointing out that, you know, currently, although the data may be available weekly, that might not actually be necessary. And this is one thing we know post-disasters is that metrics, um, you know, you can slow the frequency as ch the pace of change slows post-disaster. So that could be something to look into. The other thing that, that um, causes frequent change um, post-disaster, as everybody is now saying, you know, is, is obviously market changes. Um, changes in demand, but also policy. And we've had some recent um, significant um, policy changes uh, that may drive some uh, frequent, uh, drive some 
um, rate of change in, in some of these indicators that will continue to benefit from a weekly uh, publication, um, but um, at a certain point, um, a weekly won't be so necessary. Um, here we go. Oh, and this is such a good one, too, that, like, you know, economically the country is um, really polarizing um, between kind of metropolitan areas and other less urban areas, and having the data at a geography finer than the state, you know, possibly down to the county level, so just so that they can be aggregated up um, to MSAs would be um, at, at a frequency higher than annual, like quarterly or monthly would be great um, and would uh, help folks understand business cycles at a local level. So if, if the Census Bureau can do that, um, and that would be fantastic. Um, and then we move on to re-engineering, uh, construction modernization re-engineering, which of course is something we've been following for a while and it is like just some of the coolest stuff. Um, we have a number of really good recommendations um, uh, about conferences that where there's some um, good state-of-the-art um, Technologies being explored and techniques, um, uh, and would recommend that the uh, Census Bureau uh, check those out. Um, and let's see. We talk a little bit about LIDAR here and have some great recommendations there. You guys are going to love this. Um, Jeff and um, Deborah and others really put. Um, some of their excellent expertise in here, and I think you'll find it very helpful. Oh, uh, yeah, street level imagery is also um, very helpful um, in, in detecting um, changes and might be something uh, that would be considered. I, um, it's, it's true, we, we found it um, post Katrina to be a really useful way to look at um, changes after that disaster, and I'm sure now, um, low these 15 years later, uh, there's a lot more that could be done with that kind of data. Um, and um, yeah, we have some final recommendations there that you can see. Lots of good stuff. Uh, okay, then moving on to new model monthly state level retail sales product. Um, this is a really exciting new product too. Um, fills a really important um, uh, data gap um, at the subnational uh, level um, with the use of that composite index. Um, and, uh, you know, we're interested in understanding more about the composite index, particularly um, investigating the use of small area estimation methods and um, that uh, would allow for more efficient small domain estimation within states, months, uh, and retail subsectors. So um, we'll be interested in kind of digging into that a little bit more. There ought to be, um, we'd like to see some more information on that. And um, we agree with the priorities of the team in trying to secure additional resources of third party data. Um, and that will be super interesting. Um, lastly, uh, you know, we just uh, encourage the Bureau, we recommend that the Bureau respond in writing to the public comments of um, Adeline Wilcox and Debbie Stein in particular, and for transparent, you know, to post your responses on the CSAC webpage of the Bureau's website, um, right below where their, where their comments will be posted. Um, you know, I think that, um, that these kind of comments are really worthy of um, uh, a written responses that, that all stakeholders can read. Um, and um, we just had a couple things in terms of logistics. Um, there's been um, not always consistent orientation of new members, uh, and um, we think that um, all new members should get uh, oriented to the census program. So the most recent new members did get oriented, but uh, there was a whole cohort of folks who, before them who didn't. Um, and then the, the ones we're just rolling off did get a great orientation. So it's not always been consistent, and we just wanna point that out as, um, a useful and important way to help um, committee members um, uh, really hit the ground running. And um, the committee thanks uh, me, and which I appreciate. Thank you all, and also all the folks who are um, rolling off. Um, and uh, we do want to recommend that as new members um, are considered that, that the Census Bureau uh, increase the gender, racial, ethnic, and age diversity of the group. 
Um, and also, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, you know, strive for a balance of experts from nonprofit, private, and academic sectors, and of and experts with connections to diverse groups of census data users. Right? Um, uh, you know, as we outlined when we discussed differential privacy last September, you know, the most impactful users, of course, are um, uh, the most uh, the highest priority uses of census data. Of course, are are the issues of apportionment and redistricting, but um, but then there's, um, you know, federal funding at all kinds of level, all kinds of regulations and, um, uh, and mandates and, um, and then finally community uses. Um, and, um, and the academic users are um, very, very important, but not the only ones. So um, I know that um, when Ron Jarman asked me to join this committee six years ago, he, he indicated he uh, wanted to, to include me to have more data users um, of various types on the committee, and I've been delighted to serve and be part of that. So I hope that there'll be some good um, diverse data users added to the committee, um, and the CSAC is officially recommending um, those kind of users be added and also um, uh, greater diversity across the committee. So uh, I think that's it. Uh, CSAC members, did I, did I miss anything? I'm gonna... I hope you were able to see that. And in a second, I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to ask you all to raise your hands to make sure we're all in agreement. I've got to make sure I can see you raise your hands. One second. Chat, okay. Um, okay. Hmm. Okay, there we go. I see hands raised. I've got Andrew J, Jeff, Juan Pablo, Deborah, Kunal, Tom, Krishna, Jessica, Rochelle, John Chaika. Let me make sure I'm seeing everybody. Uh, uh, Bill, uh huh. Uh, Mario, you got your hand up. Kathy Pettit. Mario might be attending to his son. I know he's um, doing double duty. Chris Moore, can you uh, raise your hand? Mm -hmm. Or just say you approve. My hand is raised. Great. Okay, good. Mario, are you there? Can you hear us? Um, I'm sure that Mario has uh, stepped away. Shauna, can we consider Mario not in the meeting? And we still have a quorum. Yeah, so plus you're, you're obtaining consensus. Doesn't have to be unanimous. Okay, good. Well, um, we have consensus, and um, everybody was a part of this discussion. So I'm proud to present our recommendations for this meeting, and I want to thank uh, very much the committee for um, helping me meet the goal of actually completing all of this in these two days. You guys did an awesome job. You're the best. And I will turn it back over to you, Tommy. Thank you very much, Allison. Actually, my uh, script says at 4.58, and it's 4.58. <laughs> this, is, this is perfect. I want to thank uh, the committee members for this uh, very fine and thoughtful uh, feedback and recommendations to the Census Bureau. They will get complete and serious uh, consideration, as always. And a special thanks to you, Allison, for your uh, just enthusiastic and, and, and outstanding uh, leadership of the uh, committee. I also want to express thanks to the presenters uh, who uh, prepared uh, and, and, uh, and, and gave us uh, things to, to consider. And, and a special thanks to the advisory committee branch. Uh, I'm, I don't usually call names, but I'm going to call Shauna, uh, uh, Tony, and uh, Helen, and I'm going to include Kim, and, and also for Anthony for, for, not, for being in the background there too. These folks make it work. You, you help bring us together and we're very grateful for it. Uh, unless uh, there's anything else, Shauna, do I need to say anything else? Is there anything I'm overlooking? Oh, the uh, next, the next meeting, the, the next meeting, the next meeting is tentatively scheduled for September 23rd and 24th. Uh, Alice, I was just going to say a special thank you to you, Tommy. You have been such a pleasure to work with. Really, I love the um, the Jeopardy. Every Friday morning of our meetings, All right. really, and when we do it in person, it's so much more fun. But it's really a pleasure to work with you. Yeah, you've been a font of wisdom. Thank you. And the same here. I'm really going to miss you, Allison. Well, 
Thank uh, you. Nothing else. Thanks, everyone. Uh, the meeting is now ended. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. All right. That concludes today's call. All participants may disconnect. Speakers, please stand by.